Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I'd like to ask you something. What do you consider your most attractive feature? Your hair? Your eyes? Complexion? Your figure? Whatever, each of us is abundantly aware, though there are some who would deny it, of his or her most captivating attribute. And make the most of it, though there are some who deny that too. Be all this as it may. We're about to hear of a woman whose most beguiling characteristic was her smile. And because of it, the horrible thing that happened. Yes, I am dying. But I tell you, Ernest, I tell you, you will never be rid of me. Even when I am in my coffin in the family vault, you will never be rid of me. Never, Ernest. Never. I think. Yes, she's gone. Berenice is dead. No. No. Ernest, Ernest, don't take on now. Don't. Her mouth. Those lips bared. Her teeth. She is staring at me with her teeth, Anthony. Anthony, in heaven's name, close her mouth. Close her mouth! <laughs> Our mystery drama, Berenice, was adapted from the Edgar Allan Poe classic, especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar, and stars Michael Tolan and Norman Rose. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. we call a fixation, an ide fix, is one of the most extraordinary and mystifying aspects of the human mind. For example, love, young love at least, is a fixation, for the lover cannot get the loved one out of his thoughts. He thinks of her night and day, or she of him. And there is, I need scarcely say, no more wondrous person in all the world. What cure can be found for a fixation. Well, 
when it comes to love, and I don't mean to sound cynical, I suppose marriage. But when it came to Ernest Montresor and his wife, Berenice, uh, well, that's our story. Do not tell me, Anthony, what I must do or must not do. Ernest, please. You are my friend. You are my attorney. You have come here to Mangrove Manor to straighten out whatever legal matters attend Berenice's death. And that is all. Ernest, I didn't mean to offend you. I am not offended. I am irritated. You can sit there and say, Ernest, your wife is dying. Try not to hate her as you do. Let me tell you something, my good friend. Had you lived one month, one week, one day in this house with Berenice, that shrew, that spitfire, you too would know what hate is. But I don't understand. I was at your wedding a little over a year ago, here at Mangrove, and you were deliriously in love with her. Not her. Her smile. What? I know you'll find it hard to believe, but that is the truth. Oh, there were other qualities that attracted me, her... Charm, her gentle manner, her warmth. But these vanished quickly once we were married. I soon learned that her charm was a veneer, her gentle manner a mask that concealed a vicious temper. I am sorry. I didn't want to hate her. For months I put all feelings of hate from me. The while asking myself how and why I still went on loving her. That's when I realized it was her smile. I still fail to understand. Look at Berenice closely and you will see that she's really very plain. Almost ugly. But one doesn't look closely at first. I didn't, surely, because of her smile, of what her smile was then. She had teeth so even, so white, so perfect, they are as matched pearls. As for her lips, nowhere will you find lips so beautifully modeled, so sensuously inviting, so absolutely enthralling. I remember, yes. But Anthony, soon after our marriage, her smile changed, too. The lovely contour of her lips became an ugly sneer. She no longer smiled. She bared her teeth like a vicious animal. But there must have been a reason, something that impelled her to... I'll give you a reason, if you must have it. Constance. Berenice's younger sister? Yes. You know she came to live here at Mangrove when her husband died. I I settled the estate, yes. Not, I'm afraid, that there was much to settle. He left her penniless. Precisely why she lived here. Berenice began to think... Go no further, Ernest. I am well acquainted with what is termed the eternal triangle. In this case, there was no triangle. Not then. But there is now. Constance is what Berenice pretended to be. Gentle, innocent, loving. Yes, I have fallen in love with her, and she with me. But you may believe me, as Berenice never has, when I tell you that our love is and has ever been platonic. Neither of us has betrayed Berenice in any way. Yes, come. Oh, Constance, my dear. We were just speaking of you. You remember Anthony Lamb. With pleasure. You were such a help and comfort to me when my husband died, Mr. Lamb. I did what I could. You... You look upset, Constance. Berenice wants to see you. And she's in one of her blackest moods, I'm afraid. Is she ever in any other? Try not to be harsh on her, Ernest. She's dying, you know. I shall try. If you'll excuse us, Anthony... Uh, perhaps I should come along. I have to discuss certain legal matters with Berenice, and it will be best if she knows I'm here. Come, then. But I warn you, my friend, you'll regret every moment spent with her. Uh, it's you. You wanted to see me, Berenice. You, not this army you've brought with you. Get out of here, Constance. Of course. And who are you? I've seen you somewhere. I remember you. I'm Anthony Lamb, Berenice. I don't blame you for not recognizing me. It's been over a year. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember you now, Ernest friend, the pettifogging lawyer, the shyster. Why are you here? Well, now I, uh... Yes, yes? Well, Ernest asked me to come because... Well, Bernice, I'm I'm told you're quite ill, and at such times it's, well, it's best to, to... To make sure that all will be legally neat and tidy when I'm cold in my coffin. Well, you put it much... The only way it can be put. I'm dying, and I know I'm dying, and so do you. 
If you don't, you must be blind. And if you want proof of it, look. Once my smile was the most ravishing smile on earth. Look at it now. <laughs> yes. yes, the color leaves your face, Mr. Lawyer. You all but shrink away because it's no longer the beautiful smile of the living Berenice. But the ghastly grin of the Berenice who'll soon be cold in death. Stop it. Stop smiling. Dear husband, what is it? You used to tell me my smile captivated you. Enslaved you. Can it be that it now repels you? Oh, don't turn away. I won't look at you, not when you smile. Don't look then for all the good it'll do you. You'll remember. Soon I shall be dead. But my smile will never die. It will live on in your brain, Ernest. Wherever you go, whatever you do, it will be with you. No. This smile... This ghoulish grimace. Because it was what you married. What you loved. And then came to hate. And you will hate it till the day you die, Ernest. For till that day, awake or asleep, it will haunt you. Would you care for more of the shrimp, Mr. Lamb? Well, thank you, no, Constance. Oh, and do call me Anthony, won't you? It'll make me feel so much younger. <laughs> if you wish. Ernest, won't you eat? You haven't touched a morsel. Not hungry. But you must keep up your strength. If you're not careful, you'll be having nightmares again. Nightmares, Ernest? The most horrible you can imagine. Berenice has all but ruined my health. Ruined it. Hush now, we mustn't talk that way. What other way is there? No more wine, Ernest. Another glass can do no harm. No more, dear. For my sake. For your sake, anything. Anything except to lie about my true feelings. You, Constance, you have lived in this house for nearly a year. You know the hell she has made of my life. You know that I could not mourn her passing. And what is more, you know that I love only you. Ernest, it is not the proper time. I know, I know, but I... Now, you are overwrought. It is not you speaking, but your nerves. Listen to me. Constance. My sister lies upstairs dying. Whatever you think of her, in these last days of her life, though we cannot in truth love her, we can, in all dignity and honor, try at least not to hate her. You must try, Ernest. You must. Yes. And with your help, I shall. But you will not succeed. Berenice. How did you get here, out of bed? I rang my bell, but no one came. I called, but you did not answer. We didn't hear. And so I found the strength, what strength remains, to come down and tell you I am about to die. No, no. When death is near, you know it. Full well you know it. I have little time left now. Perhaps only minutes. A glass of wine. Of course. Of course. <laughs> he hurries to assist me. To comfort me. When in his heart he would kill me. No. No, Berenice. I would not. Liar. Berenice, You I... hate me. Say it. You hate me. Say it. Here. A glass of wine you ask for. <laughs> that. Your glass of wine. Sniveling, nightmare-ridden fool. I had hoped I'd at last found a man when I married you. You were like all the others. Bellamy, let me help you back to your And bed. as for you... Did you think I wasn't on to you and your little tricks? Did you think me blind? That I couldn't see what went on between you and my husband? Nothing. Before heaven, I swear that... Liar! I saw, I know. <laughs> little Constance. Innocent, saintly, little sister. 
sinking her claws deeper and deeper into the man who was mine. <laughs> Madam. You address me? Madam, you are ill. Yet there is in you a kind of strength I have recognized before. In, I say to you, the worst kind of criminal. Ah, uh -huh. Go on. I don't know that I can. I have never understood what made these people what they were, but this I know. There are angels on this earth and there are devils. And you, madam, I say it to you, even in your dying moments, you are a devil. I, I don't blame you for looking at me like that. I, I spoke on impulse. I'm ashamed. Ashamed? You are the first man who has ever dared to... Berenice. Stay away. Stand back. Don't, don't touch me. Only listen. You will be haunted by the magnet that drew you to me. The weapon with which I ruined your life and will destroy you. My smile, Ernest. My smile. No. Look at me. Sensuous lips bearing milk white, perfectly matched teeth. Look! Oh, 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 here, let me... He's falling across the table! I think... Yes. She's gone. Berenice is dead. No. Ernest, don't. Her mouth. She is staring at me with her teeth. Anthony, in heaven's name, close her mouth. Close her mouth! I said at the outset, you'll recall, that because of Berenice's smile, a horrible thing happened. What has just happened in the dining room of Mangrove Manor is indeed horrible, but nowhere near as horrible as that which is about to take place. I will return shortly with Act Two. I think it was Sir Winston Churchill who said that when the human brain grabs hold of a thing, a worry, a concern of some sort, an anxiety, it grips that thing as in an iron fist and will not let it go. Clearly, then, this is what has happened to Ernest Montresor, who, even while she was alive, could not get his wife's sneering smile out of his head. And now that she has been placed in the family vault on the estate near Baton Rouge, Louisiana, well, listen. Ernest. Ernest. Yes, Anthony, what? It's more than half an hour since everyone left. Constance and I are getting chilled to the bone here in the vault. Let's go back to the house. Not till I'm sure the lid of Berenice's casket is nailed tight. But you are sure. It's... It's madness, I know, Anthony. But I have the fear that somehow, in some way, she'll get out of her coffin and haunt me. You're letting your imagination run away with you, Ernest. You're tired, overwrought. My sister is dead. She'll not get out of her coffin. Come now. Ernest. Yes. Let us return to the house. I'll close and lock the gate. No, I will. There. She's well nailed down in the coffin. Well locked in, too. Yes. Now let's... No, no. No, wait. Good Lord, man. What now? I must make sure the lock is strong. Sound and strong. Now, Ernest, dear, that's enough. Don't tell me what is enough. Don't... Ah, uh, Ernest. Dearest, what is it? Why are you looking at me with such fear? Never, Constance. Never so long as you live, smile at me like that again. You... You look like Berenice. But, Ernest, I... My, my nerves are shaking. I, I need a drink. Excuse me. He's in trouble, Constance. We'd, we'd best catch up with him. But, Anthony... Nothing to worry about, really. You, you just upset him a little when you smile. But that's the point. What? I didn't smile. Will you take another brandy, Anthony? Thank you, no, Constance. As they say, one is as good as more. Mm, I wish Ernest thought so. Mm. 
Yes, he is drinking a bit too much, though he doesn't show it. His nerves burn up the spirits quickly. I have never seen him in such a nervous condition, never so exhausted. Let's hope he's having a good, deep, restful sleep. Speaking of what is good for Ernest, I hope you'll be able to stay with us a while, Anthony. I should like to, but I have pressing business in Baton Rouge. A few days? It will be such a comfort to Ernest. I'm sure, but the comfort he really needs is... is what you can give him. Constance, may I speak frankly? Of course. In ordinary circumstances, by which I mean had Ernest and Berenice still loved each other, I'd not suggest anything of this sort, but... For all things considered, Constance, I should like to see you marry Ernest as soon as possible. Berenice not yet cold in her grave, and you? I do, yes. Constance, you alone can give him the love and the warmth he so desperately needs. I I know, but... Oh, Anthony, whatever she was, Berenice was my sister. How can I, in all conscience, marry her husband within so short a time? It would be an act of... Indecency. Oh, no, an act of charity and of love. My dear, no immediate decision is needed. Think about it and should... No! Oh. What? What in the name of heaven? It's Ernest. No! Come, quick! No! Oh, Ernest, merciful Lord, what is it? Oh. oh, it's you. You, good friend, and... And Constance... Then it was a dream. What was, my dearest? I... I dreamed that I was awake, that I'd awakened from a sound sleep. It was all so real. I... I heard the storm outside and saw lightning brighten the room and thought, Oh, good, I... I did manage to sleep and get some rest, and now I've awakened and... Yes, and? And then... Then I saw it, hanging in the darkness of the room... Burning bright in the black pitch of night. Saw it. Gently, my darling. Gently now. Saw what? Her smile. Berenice's smile. Her disembodied smile. Nothing else. It hung suspended in the dark before my eyes. The lips drawn back. The teeth shining in the blackness. Oh, Ernest. Ernest. And then... And then her teeth... Those terrifying white, even teeth parted as she began to laugh. The most hideous laugh I have heard in all my life. Her mouth, her bodiless mouth as it laughed, it started coming closer to me. Closer, closer. And I, I screamed, I screamed. Anthony, what's to be done? We must fetch the doctor, and at once. <laughs> Bit. Oh, let's rest. Of course, my dear. Of course. <laughs> Here, let me help you down. Uh, oh. <laughs> Thank you, Ernest. There's a log over there. Shall we sit? I would rather stand and hold you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are feeling better. Come, let's sit down. No, no, wait. Ernest? Please listen, Constance. Anthony returns to Baton Rouge tomorrow. I had a talk with him this morning. He knows I'm devoted to you and you to me. He urged, not that I needed urging, that I ask you to marry me. Ernest, I... Do say yes, Constance. I beg you. Say you'll marry me. (laughs) That's exactly what I was going to say once you gave me the chance. You... You will? You'll marry me? Oh, I will. Oh, I will. Constance... Oh, Constance. Let's hurry back and tell Anthony. Yes, that dear good friend of yours will be relieved to know, I'm sure. Here, I'll give you a hand up. There. Oh, oh, Ernest, my horse. Oh, oh. Ernest, he's running away with me. Anthony, I must go up. Patience, good friend. The doctor should be down any moment. But he's been with her for more than an hour. I knew she was seriously injured. I knew at the instant I picked her up. The way you described it, it was a bad fall. The horse, running away, for what reason God alone knows, tried to leap a high fence, failed to make it, and came down rolling on Constance as she lay beneath him. Oh, terrible, terrible. But no sense anticipating the worst. Constance may not be seriously hurt at all. 
Constance is dying. What? She is dying. Oh, come now, Ernest. You carry even your nerves too far. There's something I... I didn't tell you. When I got to Constance, she was unconscious. I knelt beside her, got my arms under her, raised her, and stood up. I began to carry her to the house. A long distance. I'm not very strong. I tire easily. And so after a short time, I stopped for breath and looked at her. Looked into her face, Anthony. Yes? Her eyes were open, and she was smiling. The lips pulled back, the teeth showing. Or... For an instant, she looked like Berenice. For that instant, she was Berenice. Doctor? Doctor, is she... Don't bother him now, Ernest. But I can bear no more of this waiting, this interminable waiting. Look at her. So deathly white, scarcely breathing, if at all. Ernest? She called my name. Constance. Oh, my own dear Constance. Hush now. When? When I am gone. No, you must not go. You cannot leave me. You cannot. When I am gone, I say, no longer with you. Remember that it will be only on this earth I am not with you. In spirit, I shall be beside you always. You are not going to die. You will be at my side, alive and beautiful, and my own dear adored wife. No. That is not to be. Berenice has seen to that. Berenice? She was there. Just before my horse leaped the fence, I did not fancy it. She was there. She stood on the other side of the fence, smiling. Oh, God in heaven. And I knew... In the second that I saw her, the second before the horse crashed, I knew that she is a tormented soul, a soul that cannot rest until she has forgiven the sins she committed on earth, the sins she committed against you. There is no forgiveness for what she did. There is. It is in your heart, my darling, if you will only search for it and find it. You... You are asking me to forgive her? Yes. Never. I could never. You must. You must. For my sake. Will you try? That is all I ask before I leave you, my dearest. Will you try? I... I will try. And I, in another world, will love you for it more than I have ever loved you in this. Kiss me. Oh, no. No, not if by saying that you tell me the time is near. Not if you tell me that. Yes. Oh, yes. Constance? Constance? I'm sorry, Ernest. She's gone. Oh, no. Leave him to me, doctor. You have other matters to handle. Come, Ernest. Sit down. Here in this chair. Sit and I'll pour you a brandy. Dead. 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 I know how you feel. But you mustn't go to pieces. Think of what she said. That she will be with you. At your side always. What good is that if I cannot see her? Touch her. What is he doing, the doctor? What must be done? Closing her eyes... Straightening her limbs, placing her hands in repose. When he is finished, I shall sit with her, Anthony. Of course. And not leave her side till we take her to the vault. What's that? What? Listen. Someone laughing. No one is laughing. Berenice. It is Berenice. She is laughing from the vault. From the vault. You doubt me? Here. I throw wide the window. You hear? You hear? I hear nothing. <laughs> Laughing in triumph. Vicious triumph because once again she shattered my heart. <laughs> laugh, damn you, laugh. But I shall have done with you yet. I shall. I shall. I... Oh. Doctor, quickly. He's fainted dead away. So 
so in fevered imagination, in the sickened mental state brought on by unbearable grief, Ernest fancies he hears the hideous laughter of Berenice pursuing him, haunting him, driving him mad in death as she did in life. Or is it fancy? We'll know more about that when I return for Act Three. This is WBBM, Chicago, News Radio 78, 41 degrees at Midway Airport. Scarcely has the breath of life fled the body of his beloved Constance than Ernest Montresor hears, or thinks he hears, the triumphant laughter of his dead wife, Berenice. Even though Ernest's friend and attorney, Anthony Lamb, did not hear the laughter, can we say the laughter echoed only in Ernest's imagination? If it comes to that, who can say that imagination is not reality? Be that as it may, let us now join Ernest and Anthony in that family vault. It would seem that you're right, Anthony. Berenice must still be in her coffin. The lid is tightly nailed. Of course. But her laughter... So horribly clear. Ernest, there was no laughter. You imagined it. No, no, I heard it. She murdered Constance. She made the horse run away, fall, and kill her. Oh, Anthony, how can I rid myself of Berenice? Can I get rid of her? She was vile, vicious, clever. Clever. What? Clever. That's it, clever. We look at this coffin lid. We see it tightly nailed, and so we think she's still there. Of course she is. No, don't you see? She was clever enough to nail it shut again after she left it. Here, give me that pry iron. You're not going to... I must be sure. I must make absolutely certain she is still in her coffin. Otherwise, I dare not bring Constance here. Ernest, can't you understand? Constance will lie here in the same vault with Berenice. If Berenice has the power to leave her coffin, what might she not do to the sister she hated as she hated me? You see? You see? You understand? Yes, yes, sir. So then... There. Well, are you satisfied? The body seems not to have moved. She is dead. No doubt about it, Berenice is dead. No question, my friend. You can set your mind at rest. Anthony, would you nail the lid back on? I want to go to Constance. Be with her until... until we bring her body here. Ernest. Yes, Anthony? Ernest, it's two o'clock in the morning. Not for her. Not for Constance. For Constance, there is no time now. Ernest, please go to bed. To bed? To dream? Once again to ride a nightmare? I asked the doctor to give me a sedative for you. Now, if you'll take... It will do no good. More harm than good. I've taken them before, and I... I cannot leave Constance alone. Not to the awful loneliness of death. I will stay with her. No. I will. I must. Ernest, hear me now. You will drive yourself mad if you go on like this. As your friend, I... <sighs> what? You heard it? I am not hearing things. That sigh. It was Constance. And look, Ernest, look. Color. Her cheeks. Color coming into her cheeks. Pulse. How, how, how do you feel for a pulse? Now let me... Yes? Yes? There, there is no pulse. And yet... A faint warmth. Her wrist beneath my hand feels... Ernest, I tell you, there is warmth. Alive. She is alive. Oh, God, God, in your merciful goodness, I thank you. Thank you. And while you're thanking God, I'll fetch the doctor. Thank you, doctor. I'm sorry to have put you through all this trouble. Thank you and good night. I'm... I'm sorry, Ernest. Strange. Strange, very. There was color in her cheeks, warmth in her body. Yet by the time the doctor arrived, the warmth had fled. The color vanished. She was once again a corpse. Anthony, what do you make of it? I cannot say. I don't know. It's one of the... 
the most baffling things I've ever seen. But then Mangrove Manor seems alive with strange things. Not so strange if you had lived a year with Berenice. If you had come to know her as the devil she was. I begin to believe you. It's four in the morning and I've been up. We both have been since early yesterday. There'll be much to do tomorrow and both of us must get some rest. No, not I. I will stay with Constance. All right, Ernest, but be sensible. But take that large armchair in the corner and see if you can at least doze for a time. Very well. I'll go to my room for an hour or two of sleep. All right. And Anthony, thank you for all you've done. That's nothing. Nothing. Constance. My lovely Constance. I'll not leave you. I shall be there in that chair across the room. In this chair, Constance, still very near you. Still watching you, waiting with you. Through the long silence of death. Again? It was you? Again? Um, you... You are sitting up. Uh, you are leaving the bed uh, and coming toward me. You are not dead. You live. Oh, let me see your face. I cannot see it. The shadows and burial shroud hiding it from me. Take the burial shroud from your face. Let me see you. Constance, beloved, let me see you. Why do you laugh, my darling? Why? Is it happiness at finding yourself alive? Is it joy in knowing you're not dead after all? Here, let me take away the shroud. There. The lips, what? The teeth. The teeth. Berenice. You are Berenice in Constance's body. Ernest, no, it was not a nightmare. I thought it was. I thought I'd had another horrible dream that I'd gone to sleep in the chair and dreamed it all. I might have thought so, too, if I'd only found you lying on the floor unconscious. But, my dear friend, I... I cannot describe my shock. Constance's body was sprawled across yours. Constance's body? But Berenice's spirit... Don't think about it. Put it out of your head. Impossible. It is etched in acid in my memory. I shall see it in every moment of my life, waking or sleeping. The lips curled back in that fearful sneer. The teeth. The teeth, the terrifying teeth. If only I could blot them from my mind, but I can't. Perhaps you can. Perhaps there is a way. What? If, as you think, Berenice is using Constance's body to haunt you, torment you... She is. She is. Then... All we need do is what we must do in any case. Bury Constance in the vault. But of course, I sicken at the thought of placing my own dear lovely Constance in that cold, moldy chamber. And yet it must be done. And with her body locked within the vault, Berenice will be unable to haunt me. But I... I must leave, Ernest. I have stayed as long as I can, far longer than I anticipated, and I, I do have other business, pressing business in Baton Rouge. The thought of being alone in this huge and empty house, is there no way to persuade you? I'm sorry, Ernest, but there isn't. I've done all I can for you. You know I have. Of course I know it. There is no better friend in all the world than you, and I have no right to urge you to stay, none at all. But I am afraid. Afraid to be alone. Afraid... Of all things, it is a madness. Afraid of Berenice's teeth. I suppose it is a form of madness. Berenice is dead and buried. Constance is dead and buried. And so Berenice cannot inhabit her corpse to torture you. She'll find a way. She will not. She will. She lies in that vault out there. And in time, her body will rot. But teeth, teeth do not... And so long as a tooth remains in her skull... Ernest, it's ten o'clock. I have a long, hard ride ahead of me tomorrow. I must get to bed, and so must you. We are both very much in need of rest. Rest? So long as I live, there will never again be any rest for me. What? What? Berenice, that laugh. 
Did I hear it or only dream? Open the window and listen. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. A dream, another nightmare. To bed, at least, too. But what is this? I'm wet to the skin. My, my night clothes are drenched. My, my feet caked with mud. Oh, wait. Wait, it comes back to me now. The dream. The nightmare. Was it a dream or did I? Anthony! 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 I'm coming. I'm coming. Good, good Lord, man. What is it now? Come in. Come into my room. Yes, but what is it? What's happened? Another of your awful nightmares? Well? I don't know. You don't know if you had a nightmare or you didn't? If it was a dream, then... Then that's what it was. But if it wasn't... If I really did the thing I thought I dreamed, then... Then, Anthony, I am mad. What do you mean? I mean that if I really did it, I've done something so horrible it could only be the work of a madman. Ernest, what did you do? I dreamed... Oh, make it a dream. But look at me. My my clothes soaked through. My my feet muddied. I I must have done it. Done what? What? I I left my bed and went outside to the tool shed. The tool shed? And found what I was looking for. And then I went to the vault. In this storm you went? Yes, to the vault. I unbolted the gate and went in. And then I pried open Berenice's coffin. Oh, no. Yes, yes. There she lay, moldering in death. But the lips drawn back and the teeth, those white, even, perfect, gruesome teeth, exposed. I... I stared at them, stared in a horror of fascination. And then taking the instrument I brought with me, I... I did what had to be done to save my sanity. What? What did you do? I dare not speak of it, put words to it. Nor can I bear to look. Look? To see, was it dream or reality? Look at what? When I... When I had done it, I returned here to my room. I... I placed the instrument on the mantel. In my dream, I placed it there. And though it must be a dream... Please, go to the mantel. See if the instrument is there. Very well, Ernest. I, I see nothing here but a pair of pliers. Oh! This, this is the instrument you used in your dream? No dream. No dream. Can't you understand that now? No dream. The pliers are there. I did it. May a merciful God forgive a man, but I did it. The, the table. My bedside table. Look there now. Look. <gasps> they are there. They are here. On your bedside table. All of them. All of Berenice's teeth. <laughs> well, a toothsome tale, was it not? Something to let your imagination chew on? Sorry, couldn't resist that. Seriously, though, this story, as many another, reflects that certain mystery which has puzzled mankind since the first tick of time. Which is the reality of our lives? Which the dream? You got me. I'll be back shortly. Once again, we have, you and I, as Will Shakespeare put it, let our imaginary forces work, coupling them with the febrile genius of Edgar Allan Poe, bringing to this strange tale our own vivid and viable fancy, an exercise very much worthwhile, good friends. 
for a lively and disciplined imagination can make our mundane lives a heaven on earth or a hell. Our cast included Norman Rose, Michael Tolan, Joan Lovejoy, and Roberta Maxwell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Nils, where is that coffee? Uh, here's my wife with it now, madame. Magna, let me help you with the tray. I don't intend to skip anything. If you're implying that I've been up to anything... Look, I... you little... Now stop it, the two of you. Well, you just tell your girlfriend... You watch that... your tongue. Flossie isn't my girlfriend, she's my fiance. What's more? <gasps> what the devil? Sorry, sir, I'm very sorry. My wife, the... The tray slipped from her... her... Magda! Look out, she's collapsing! Magda! Oh, my dearest. Let me give you a hand with her, Nils. No, sir, stand back. But, Nils... No, you... get back, sir, get back. Don't don't come near her. Can't you see? See what? <laughs> her face. She's <sighs> sweating blood. Yes, I'm afraid she has the red plague. It's worse than that. She's brought it here. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Mindwebs, short stories from the worlds of speculative fiction. This edition of Mindwebs is in two parts. We have two separate stories for you. First of all, one titled Happily Ever After, authored by William F. Nolan. It's from a collection he edited called A Wilderness of Stars. The author writes, I always wanted to try a simple variation on the Garden of Eden theme. Finally, I did. The result is short, direct, and I sincerely hope entertaining. A 
On the way back to level 12 in the space cab, Donald Spencer couldn't resist the impulse to sing. The android pilot looked curiously at him, and Spencer smiled. I'm just happy. Bought a rather expensive wedding present today to celebrate the end of bachelorhood. I've been a married man for exactly six hours and 27 minutes. The pilot said, Congratulations. I hope that you and your wife will live happily ever after. Spencer nodded at this ancient response. Feed an android information and the standard cliches emerge. But it was something to think about. Living happily ever after. Paula Spencer impatiently watched her husband step out of the humming space cab. He waved a greeting as the walk brought him swiftly down to her. And then he was in her arms. Well, where is it? You said you're going out to buy a wedding present. And so I did. It's up there. What's up where? Our wedding present. I bought us an asteroid. Oh, Don, you're joking. 20,000 credits is no joke. <laughs> we are now the legal owners of asteroid K-157 and Luani Cluster. But can we afford it? It's a solid investment, honey. Nobody loses money on asteroids these days. Now, I've arranged everything. <laughs> we leave tonight for the cluster. Our living quarters are all set up and waiting. So how's about a smile for your rich new husband? Oh, I'll do better than that. The trip out to the cluster was perfect. As their new home swung into sight on the ship's wide view screen, Donald Spencer knew that he'd made a shrewd purchase. In ten years, an asteroid would fetch at least 50,000 credits on the Earth market. A furiously expanding population guaranteed it. Some of his business friends had been skeptical, warning him against the deal, telling him that no one really knew much about the Luani cluster, that he might run into trouble out there, but Spencer ignored them. They were simply jealous of his business ability. In a few years, Luani would be completely settled and real estate would soar. Ready, darling? <laughs> the couple shook hands with the captain and transferred to their personal landing craft. Spencer raised a hand and a section of the passenger rocket's outer hull slid back. The small silver craft bulleted toward K-157, leaving the giant ship behind to continue its galactic voyage. The landing was smooth, and Donald Spencer took his wife's hand after the atomic motor had stilled. Happy? Oh, you know I am, Don. Hey, come on. Meet your asteroid. <laughs> they scrambled out of the ship. The air was heavy but breathable. In rising waves, the tall blue trees and multicolored vegetation of asteroid K-157 pressed around them, all but engulfing their tiny spacecraft. I had a section cleared for us. Mm -hmm. The house is just there beyond those trees. Oh, I can hardly wait to see it. She ran ahead of him across the springy green soil, and he joined her at the clearing's edge, smiling <laughs> at her reaction. Oh, Don, it's wonderful, all I'd hoped for. The new house was low and modern, sculptured to the alien soil, a flat, plastic brick structure gleaming under double suns. As they approached it, the front door slid silently open for them. All the comforts of Earth, even a microfilm library. Are we, uh, alone here? Absolutely. <laughs> the last of the building crew was due out yesterday. The entire place is ours. Paula darted through the house, exclaiming at all the latest electronic marvels. <laughs> In the bedroom, she turned to face him. We're going to make this the most tremendous honeymoon any couple ever had. That will be a pleasure. Later that night, Donald Spencer awoke to find the bed empty beside him. He got up quickly calling Paula's name. When she failed to answer, he pulled on his robe and rushed outside into the bright moonlight. Paula, are you out here? Then Spencer saw her, standing at the edge of the clearing, facing the massed line of blue trees. Darling, I, I was worried. He put a hand on her shoulder. She turned calmly, the moonlight filling her eyes. I needed some fresh air. The room was stifling. You sure you're all right? Paula didn't reply, turning slowly away from him. Spencer was puzzled, strangely uneasy, yet nothing seemed to be wrong. Let's go back to the house. No, I want to stay out here. But... You go back in if you wish. Spencer shrugged, a little angry. He walked back, trying to pinpoint the difference he had noticed in Paula. She had somehow changed. Exactly how have I changed, Donald? He spun around. She had followed him back, and then he gasped. How had she known? What you were thinking? Because I can read your mind now, of course. She stood there in the doorway, framed in soft moonlight, smiling at him as a mother smiles at her child. It's true. I can also move faster than you can. 
I'm much stronger. In fact, I could easily kill you with one blow. Easily. Good God. What kind of nonsense is this? Not nonsense. Fact. All of it can be yours, too. The trees will accept you. I know they will. Spencer began to speak, but she raised a silencing hand. I walked out for air earlier while you slept, but it was not really for air at all. The trees had called me. They wanted me to become part of them, part of this place, and so I did. Paula, what are you telling me? That this asteroid is alive. That the blue trees are alive and have mental powers far beyond our own. They called me tonight, and I went out to them, ate the fruit I found on their branches. Then I was one of them. I'm sure they want you too, Don. Go to them. You're, you're just tired. With Trip, the new house. Maybe in the morning we in can... In the morning... Go- I won't be here. At least, not as you see me. The mutation will be complete by then. This creature you call Paula will be gone. I'll be part of them. She extended a hand, and Spencer saw that she held a triangular piece of fruit, which cast a subtle blue glow in the darkness. We're in a new Garden of Eden. Eat this and you'll be free, as I am free. Spencer moved back from her. He believed Paula now. She had changed. And something on this asteroid had affected that change. The Luani cluster was undeveloped, wholly alien. No one could specify exactly what man would encounter here. That was one of the risks. He knew he'd made a terrible error in seeking out this place, that because of his error, the woman he had loved was lost to him. Paula was no longer his wife, no longer human. Well, Don? I... I don't want to join you. I'll leave in the morning. The house, the asteroid, zeroes, everything. She (laughs) laughed, and a sudden chill made him shiver beneath his robe. You'll never leave. No one can. All the others, the construction crew, they're out with the trees. By morning, you'll be one of us. Then I won't wait for morning. I'll go now. I can make contact with a passenger ship near Ariel. (laughs) You're acting like a fool, Don. Her voice was edged. Whatever possessed her was angry. Spencer turned, entered the bedroom, and hurriedly began to dress. Paula watched him from the doorway, unsmiling, silent. He walked quickly past her out to the waiting spacecraft. Paula, goodbye. Not goodbye, Don. There'll never be a goodbye for us. Spencer mounted the ladder, opened the airlock, put one foot inside the rocket, then an impulse he turned. The trees seemed much closer. They are. You only have a few seconds, Don. Eat from the tree or... Or what? Or be destroyed with the rocket. Go to hell. And he closed the airlock. Outside, the trees were all around the silver ship. The clearing had completely vanished. Sweating and impatient, Spencer turned to the controls and then paused. He slowly raised his head. Something, someone was calling him with an urgency he could not resist. Something wanted him. The trees. The trees wanted him. Moving with a calm deliberation, Spencer opened the lock. They waited for him offering their shining blue branches in the bright moonlight, offering immortality. He climbed down the ladder, putting out a hand toward Paula, toward the fruit of the tree. Hungrily, he ate of the fruit. Paula welcomed him into her arms. Now, my darling, we're together again. Forever. Spencer smiled at her, then looked at the trees. He wondered why he had been unwilling to accept his destiny. Men were so weak and foolish, so hopelessly mortal. And on asteroid K-157 of the Luani Cluster, Donald and Paula Spencer lived happily ever after. heard Happily Ever After, a story by William F. Nolan. Joining me in the reading 
were Carrie Frumpkin and Marty Van Cleef. second portion of the program, I do a story titled Born of Man and Woman. It's from the book Third from the Sun by Richard Matheson. This day when it had light, mother called me wretch. You wretch, she said. I saw in her eyes the anger. I wonder what it is, a wretch. This day it had water falling from upstairs. It fell all around. I saw that. The ground of the back I watched from the little window. The ground it sucked up the water like thirsty lips. It drank too much, and it got sick and runny brown. I didn't like it. Mother is a pretty, I know, in my bed place with cold walls around. I have a paper things that was behind the furnace. It says on it, screen stars. I see in the pictures faces like of mother, And father, father says they are pretty. Once he said it. And also mother, he said. Mother, so pretty, and me, decent enough. Look at you, he said, and didn't have the nice face. I touched his arm and said, it is all right, father. He shook and pulled away where I couldn't reach. Today, mother let me off the chain a little so I could look out the little window. That's how I saw the water falling from upstairs. This day it had goldness in the upstairs. As I know when I looked at it, my eyes hurt. After I look at it, the cellar is red. I think this was church. They leave the upstairs. The big machine swallows them and rolls out past and is gone. In the back part is the little mother. She is much small than me, I am. I can see out the little window all I like. In this day when it got dark, I had eat my food and some bugs. I hear laughs upstairs. I like to know why there are laughs for. I took the chain from the wall and wrapped it around me. I walked squish to the stairs. They creak when I walk on them. My legs slip on them because I don't walk on stairs. My feet stick to the wood. I went up and opened a door. It was a white place, white as white jewels that come from upstairs sometime. I went in and stood quiet. 
I hear the laughing some more. I walk to the sound and look through to the people. More people than I thought was. I thought I should laugh with them. Mother came out and pushed the door in. It hit me and hurt. I fell back on the smooth floor and the chain made noise. I cried. She made a hissing noise into her and put her hand on her mouth. Her eyes got big. She looked at me. I heard father call. What fell? He called. She said a iron board. Come help pick it up, she said. He came and said, Now, is that so heavy you need? He saw me and grew big. The anger came in his eyes. He hit me. I spilled some of the drip on the floor from one arm. It was not nice. It made ugly green on the floor. Father told me to go to the cellar. I had to go. The light, it hurt some now in my eyes. It is not so like that in the cellar. Father tied my legs and arms up. He put me on my bed. Upstairs I heard laughing while I was quiet there looking on a black spider that was swinging down to me. I thought what father said. Oh, God, he said, and only ate. This day, father hit in the chain again before it had light. I have to try to pull it out again. He said I was bad to come upstairs. He said never do that again, or he would beat me hard. That hurts. I hurt. I slept the day and rested my head against the cold wall. I thought of the white place upstairs. I got the chain from the wall out. Mother was upstairs. I heard little laughs very high. I looked out the window. I saw all little people like their little mother and little fathers, too. They are pretty. They were making nice noise and jumping around the ground. Their legs was moving hard. They are like mother and father. Mother says all right people look like they do. One of the little fathers saw me. He pointed at the window. I let go and slid down the wall in the dark. I curled up as they would not see. I heard their talks by the window and foots running. Upstairs, there was a door hitting. I heard the little mother call upstairs. I heard heavy steps and I rushed in my bed place. I hit the chain in the wall and lay down on my front. I heard mother come down. Have you been at the window? She said. I heard the anger. Stay away from the window. You have pulled the chain out again. She took the stick and hit me with it. I didn't cry. I can't.
do that. But the drip ran all over the bed. She saw it and twisted away and made a noise. Oh, my God, my God, she said. Why have you done this to me? I heard the stick go bounce on the stone floor. She ran upstairs. I slept the day. This day it had water again. When mother was upstairs, I heard the little one come slow down the steps. I hidded myself in the coal bin for mother would have anger if the little mother saw me. She had a little live thing with her. It walked on the arms and had pointy ears. She said things to it. It was all right, except the live thing smelled me. It ran up the coal and looked down at me. The hairs stood up in the throat. It made an angry noise. I hissed, but it jumped on me. I didn't want to hurt it. I got fear because it bit me harder than the rat does. I hurt, and the little mother screamed. I grabbed the live thing tight. It made sounds I never heard. I pushed it all together. It was all lumpy and red on the black. Coal. I hid there when mother called. I was afraid of the stick. She left. I crept over the coal with the thing. I hid it under my pillow and rested on it. I put the chain in the wall again. This is another times. Father chained me tight. I hurt because he beat me. This time I hit the stick out of his hands and made noise. He went away and his face was white. He ran out of my bed place and locked the door. I am not so glad all day it is cold in here. The chain comes slow out of the wall. And I have a bad anger with mother and father. I will show them I will do what I did that once. I will screech and laugh loud. I will run on the walls. Last, I will hang head down by all my legs and laugh and drip green all over until they are sorry they didn't be nice to me. If they try to beat me again, I'll hurt them. I will. was Richard Matheson's story, Born of Man and Woman, from his book, Third from the Sun. This is Michael Hansen speaking, engineering by Steve Gordon. Mindwebs is a production of WHA Radio in Madison, a service of University of Wisconsin Extension.
If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. What made me first suspect Joe was that he knew more than any innocent person should have known. I suspected Irene the moment I heard the fireman's testimony. The apparently unimportant fact I suspected, that I suspected, I suspected the postman after he I testified. Suspected. I suspected. I suspected. Listen to radio's newest, most interesting, and thrilling program, Suspicion. Suspicion. Somewhere in the drama about to be presented is a seemingly unimportant fact, a hidden clue that first casts suspicion on the ultimate culprit. Listen regularly to this thrilling series. Test your powers of observation and deduction and find the hidden clue. It may be a single line, a sound, perhaps a complete scene. All names and characters depicted in the story are fictitious. Any resemblance to persons living or dead is entirely coincidental. In the story we presented last time in this series... Honor Among Thieves, do you remember this scene? An invention hidden behind a secret panel in Anton Collot's home has been stolen. When Gascon and the French Sûreté arrived and examined the secret wall panel... Size 4 crowbar, 6 dents in frame of panel on lower left corner. No dent in panel itself. That was the hidden clue, ladies and gentlemen. Had the panel really been forced open, there would have been dents in both panel and frame. Anton Collot stated that only he knew how to release the catch of the panel. After opening the panel, he dented the frame to make it appear that it was forced open. And now, kidnappers! Shortly after 11 o'clock on the evening of August 2nd, as Homer Welch, prominent financier, living in a large city on the Pacific coast, drives home alone from a business meeting, he brings his automobile to an abrupt stop as... Sammy, what's the matter with you? Haven't you any better sense than to shoot out of a driveway? At Keep your seconds? shirt on, pal. Who are you? Just a guy who figures you got too much money for your own good. Move over. I'm driving, see? Kidnappers, eh? Help! Uh, police! 
You asked for it, pal. Hey, monkey, get that jalopy out of the way. It's time we were scramming. Hello? Yes, this is Mrs. Homer Welch. Yes, I've been expecting him. What's that? Kidnapped. Why, yes. Yes. I'll do anything you say. No, I won't notify the... Hello? Hello? Hello, operator. Operator, I've been cut off. Hello? Operator. Operator. Wesley, Wesley, all the West kidnapped last night. Read all about it. Wesley, Wesley. Hello? Hello? Yes, this is Mrs. Homer Welch. No, no, I didn't tell the police. It must have been the maid. She came in just as... Yes? Twenty thousand dollars? Yes. Yes, I'll... Uh... Hello? 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 Well, they've probably hung up again, Mrs. Welch. Now then, if you'll just tell us how and where they want the ransom, we'll set a trap and land the whole no, bunch... No, no. What? No, I'm going to do exactly as they tell me. Homer would do that if I had been kidnapped. But, Mrs. Welch, it isn't as simple as that. Kidnapping is a crime against the people, not just against one person or family. I'm going to follow their instructions to the letter, Mr. Wesley. Later on, after my husband is back, naturally we'll do everything we can to help you and your men. Well, I guess that's fair enough. Now, is there anything I can do to help you, Mrs. Welch? Well, you could drive me down to the bank if you don't mind. I'll do better than that. You phone the bank and tell them how much money you want and in what size bills. I'll go down and get the package for you. That's very kind of Uh, you. You know, they might phone again while you were out. Yes, yes, I hadn't thought of that. I'll call the bank, Mr. Wesley, and tell him you'll be down in a few moments. And I promise you that as soon as Mr. Welch is back, we'll do all we can to help. Wesley, Wesley, Piper, read all about it. Homer Welch returned unharmed. Wesley, Wesley, Piper, Homer Welch returns back to Piper. Well, Jessen, there's no use questioning Homer Welch again. He says he was knocked out before he had a chance to see them, and his eyes had been taped before he came to. Isn't there any clues to where he was held? Well, he's sure he was held near some country village. Perhaps Menlo, or Crossroad, or Black Hollow, or any one of a dozen more. We'll have to search them all, I guess. Well, as long as we have the numbers of the ransom bills, there's a chance. Uh, hello, Wesley speaking. What's that? A ten-dollar ransom note, eh? Oh, do you know where he lives? Henry Mongrose, 811 South Parker Street, apartment 6. Uh, I see. You haven't seen him for the last couple of days, eh? Oh, yes. Thanks for the tip, and we'll take care of you. Come on, Jessen. He's coming. Have your gun ready. Uh, are you Henry Montrose? Yes, what is it? We'd like to talk to you for a minute. Let's go inside. But look We're here. from headquarters. And don't try any smart stuff, see? Well, what have I done? Have you seen this $10 bill before? Perhaps. I'm sure I don't know. I'm not in the habit of writing my name on everything. All right, time. save it, wise guy. Wipe the shaving cream off your face and come along with us. You're under arrest on suspicion of kidnapping. The following morning at Crossroads, a small town 15 miles west, Turn sign it, Marthy. What's going over here? Mm-hmm. Ever since you seen the paper this morning, you've been meandering about the house like you've seen a ghost or something. Harold, this is the man, all right? Huh? What man? His picture on the front page is of the same identical man mm-hmm. I seen crossing the North Field the night before last. Well, I sworn. You, you certain about that, Marthy? Of course I be. There was a full moon and I seen him as plain as day. He couldn't have been more than 200 feet away from me. He turned around and I seen his face just as plain as I seen yours. Of course I... Hey, where are you going? You're phone the police, of course. What in tarnation would you be doing? Hello, operator. This is Hiram Jones. I want to put through a long-distance car, I do, and I don't want no listening in. Get that? Why don't you get smart, Montrose? It's only a question of time till we get your accomplices. I told you I don't know a thing about it. I don't know where I got that $10 bill. I haven't any idea. And if I'm not allowed to see my attorney immediately, I'll sue you and the whole doggone oh, police yeah. force for... Uh, hello, Wesley speaking. Who's this? Hiram Jones of Crossroads, eh? Yes? Yes? She's positive. Yes. Yes, we'll go down and see her at once. 
Thanks for calling. Well, Montrose, the game's up. You were seen near the town of Crossroads the night before last, and I have a hunch Welch was held there. Crossroads? I haven't been out that way in six months. No? Listen, you were seen there. Now, why don't you get smart and turn state's evidence? How can I? I, I didn't kidnap Welch. Okay, it's your hanging, not mine. And... Hello, Wesley speaking. Oh, send him in. Well, Welch has just gotten here. It'll be tough if he identifies you. He never saw me. Maybe. Oh, good morning, Mr. Welch. Good morning, Mr. Welch. Now, take a good look at this man. Well? I never saw him before. What? Why, at least I don't believe I ever saw him before. Still, it was dark. Now, you'd better think it over for a while, Mr. Welch. He can't account for the ransom bill he had, and he hasn't an alibi. Further, we have a witness who does identify him positively. All right, come along, Montrose. Hey, hey, you fellas, you city police? Why, yes, sir. You Mr. Hiram Jones? Yes, sir. You can just come this way, and my woman will identify this scoundrel. She will. We're law-abiding folk in these parts, and we don't have no truck with criminals. No, I'm sure you don't. All I want is your ringside seat at that fellow's trial. Hey, Marcy? Yes? The city cops and the kidnappers here. Well, what do you know? Now then, is uh, this the man you saw, Mr. Jones? Yes. He's the same identical man, all right. Ah, you'll sign a statement to that effect. Yes, sir, I certainly will. And if you want me to give my testimony in a court of law, I'll do that, too. Well, thanks for your cooperation. Now, then, we'll have a look around Crossroads before going back to town. Well, Montrose, what have you got to say now? If you're smart, you'll turn state's evidence before going on trial. But maybe you're not smart. Well, they watch the fight. We'll read all about it. Get that red light out at Crossroads, Bob. Right, three, right, three. Suspect Link not guilty. Read all about it. Watch, three, watch. But Jones gotten here yet, Jesson? You should know. You were going out to Crossroads this morning to bring him in, Wesley. Oh, by George, I'd forgotten. And will the DA scream if they're not here when court convenes? Uh, give him a ring, will you? And tell them I'll be there in about 25 minutes. Hello? Justin speaking? No, Wesley just left for... What? What's that? Both of them, eh? Did they say anything before they died? Yeah, wait till I get a pencil. Okay, shoot. Mrs. Jones? Mrs. Jones, it's me, Mr. Wesley. Oh, I didn't see you good at first. I thought maybe the other kidnappers was coming after me. Whenever someone knocks on the door, I stand by the wall here and study them for a minute. You've come to take us to the trial, eh? Oh, yes. I'm sorry I'm so late, but I had so many things to do that I almost forgot to come for you. But we'll be in court in plenty of time. Uh, yes, sir. We'll go in through this door, Mrs. Jones. Now then, don't be nervous. Yeah. What's going on here, Jesson? The kidnappers are caught. Just after you started for Crossroads, they... Where? Where were they caught? They were trapped at Jonesville and tried to shoot it out. Two of them. Muggsy Phillips and Slim Anderson. They had $19,000 of the ransom with them. Well... They confessed before they died. Are they holding Montrose? What for? He's innocent. Well, yes, he is innocent. What's that? I was just going to tell the DA that we had no case against Montrose. <laughs> A short while later, in Detective Wesley's office at police headquarters... No, we really had no case against Montrose, Jessen. Only I didn't realize it until I walked into court. No case? Why, the D.A. had a fool... Oh, no, not this time. There was something the D.A. didn't know. Naturally, Montrose didn't know where he got that $10 bill. How could he? Why should he have thought about it? You see, he was innocent. And as for an alibi, well, innocent people often have a hard time proving one. But it was something else... When I... Ladies and gentlemen, did you discover the hidden clue that caused Detective Westley to suspect that Henry Montrose was not guilty of the kidnapping of Homer Welch? If you did, write into this station and tell us the hidden clue you found. And to check your powers of observation and deduction, listen for the correct hidden clue in this story the next time we present Suspicion. <laughs>
town is standard, a small Midwestern town where nothing ever happens. Quiet, peaceful, and tucked away among the cornfields and away from the dangers of the outside world. Unfortunately, there was nothing normal about standard. There has been an evil that has been awakened, and now the residents are slowly going crazy. Men for no reason are coming home and murdering their families, and dark forms are appearing in people's mirrors. The evil is spreading, and now it's up to ex-Chicago cop Rob Aletto to find it. Time is running out, and the neighbors are becoming quiet shadows as they watch him. He doesn't have long before it'll start to get into his mind, and then he himself would be making that deadly trip home. Inside the Mirrors by Jason R. Davis, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample or purchase the title on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Humphrey Bogart. Tonight's author, James M. Cain. Tonight's story, Dead Man. From Hollywood, a new dynamic series based on the work of the great names of the modern short story. Presented by the actor-producer, Humphrey Bogart. Actor-producer. Well, that's a moniker I'll have to get used to. You know, when an actor turns producer, searching for material becomes one of his main jobs. And one of mine is to read stories of all kinds. Adventure, romance, mystery, comedy. Always looking for strong yarns. Well told that will achieve the big result, entertainment. And this is the type we're going to dramatize for you. Speaking as Bogart the actor, I'd like to appear in some of them. This is especially true of the one we're going to bring you tonight by James Kane. Jim's a great student of human nature. That's evident in his novels like The Postman Always Rings Twice, Serenade, Double Indemnity, and The Moth. He doesn't write short fiction often, but in this piece, which appeared in the old American Mercury, you'll find the offbeat qualities that have made him famous. He got the idea for Dead Man one night waiting for a freight train to pass. There were some hobos perched on top of it, and, well, that's our story. But before we start, how about a word from High Averback? In this spot each week, we would have an opening commercial, followed by a short billboard. Now, for the first time on the air, James M. Cain's great short story, Dead Man, with Humphrey Bogart as Larry Knott and William Tracy as Lucky. What are we slowing down for? Why does a freight train always slow down 10 miles from nowhere in the middle of the night? Railroad bull coming down the line of Budasov. So let's get off. We're going slow enough to jump? Yeah, but too fast to get back on. Yeah, he's flashing his light now. All right, boys. Pile off. Hit the cinders. Let's go. Okay. Hey, what happened to that kid that was on here? I didn't see him jump. He climbed down in a coal chute. Hey, kid. The bull's coming. You can't hide from this Shut guy. I won't see you in this chute. Okay, okay. I'm giving you guys a break. Are you going to jump? Come on, Mick. All right. Fall easy and roll when you hit. Try to be a nice guy and they walk all over you. Anybody down that coal chute? All right, wise guy, climb out of that chute. Turn off that flashlight. I'll turn it off, you little punk. Come out. Let go of me, you big ape. Hide out on me, will you? I try to give you a break and you hide out. Oh, my God. Look out. Look out. The bottom of the chute is open. We'll... You'll go with me! All right, kid. Where are you? Ah, you're not getting away from me. Go! Why don't you let me go? You had your chance. Larry Knott ain't losing his job for a punk like you. You'll do a bit in the clink for this. You gotta get me there first. Now, big guy, this might even things up. Kid, put down that spike. I'll put it down! Oh, 
I was picking on people. I wasn't going to steal your lousy railroad. Now, maybe, maybe you let me go. Mister. Hey, mister. Mister! Wake up! Wake up! He's dead! He's dead! <laughs> Got to get back to Los Angeles before morning. See how far on this roadside. Seventeen miles. You better keep running, kid. You got a long way to go. Where are you? Who is it? It's me, kid. You know where I am. You left me there. Look, I didn't mean it. I, I didn't mean it. No, but you did it. Now you gotta run. You gotta run for the rest of your life. Just L.A., that's all. I'll, I'll be safe here, you understand? I'll be safe. You can't beat this, kid. I can, I can. I ate two meals yesterday in the soup kitchen. If I get back in time for breakfast, they'll remember me. Nobody will ever know I left the town. Nobody. Nobody. You'll know it, kid. And I'll know it. We'll always know it. You better run, kid. You can't hurt me. You're a dead man. You're dead. You're dead. Ain't there any bread to put in this slop? Oh, be glad you're living. Move on. I don't know why they're always kicking. That smells good to me. Oh, would you? You must love this grub. Thought you'd be off duty today. Me? Why would I be off? You mean you don't even get Sundays off in this joint? Sunday, wake up. This is Saturday. Saturday? Hey, that's right. It is Saturday. They're hanging signs and big banners all along the main drag for the parade. What kind of parade? The Shriners. Well, you get to see that for free. That ought to be your speed. Yeah, that's me. My name is Lucky. My name is Shorty, but I'm over six feet. Uh, nothing like that with me. I really got luck. Yeah? Like what? Like, for instance, getting a hunk of meat in this soup. Ain't no meat in there. But there's gonna be some, ain't there? Shiver plate over quick. Don't let nobody see you. Oh, thanks, Shorty. Okay, Lucky. Don't let them guys see the meat. Back of the hall ain't lighted. Grab a table back there. Sure, sure. Ain't you hungry, kid? Why don't you eat? I'll eat, I'll eat. You'd better. You'll need strength. You gotta have strength to keep moving. I made it here. I'm all right. Sure. Made sure he remember you, and the day will stick in his mind because of the parade. That's smart, but it isn't enough. Why ain't it enough? You didn't kill another hobo, kid. You killed a cop. Only a railroad bull, but still a cop. They never close the books when a cop gets killed, Lucky. They work all day and all night. They ask questions. I got answers. You better have them. And you better have them fast. You'll have to think on your feet, kid. And you're tired. I gotta get some sleep. Where, though? Where? Sign pointing up the street said Lincoln Park. It's only 6 a.m. I can sleep there. And get picked up for vagrancy? That's bad. They'll bring you in for that and then start on something else. I can hide. Must be a stable or something in a park. I gotta sleep. Take it easy, kid. You, they're watching. You're walking too fast. Mom, I didn't do anything honest. It was a mistake. You shouldn't have left home, son. I begged you not to go. Now the man is here. Tell him to go away. Tell him I'm sleeping. I'm sleeping too, Lucky. Go away. Leave me alone. No. I want you to get ready for what's coming. 
Where did you spend last night, kid? In a flop house. Yeah, which one? I didn't pay no attention to the name. It was just a flop house. Where was this flop house at, Lucky? How should I remember? I've never been in L.A. before. I don't know the names of those streets. What did the place look like? Looked like a flop house. You think they'll buy that? What did the place look like, Lucky? What did it look like? Let me go! 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 Be quiet, he won't hurt you. All right, Goliath, put him down. Down! Thanks. Thanks. How'd you get in here? The side door was open. I thought this was the park stable. It's the elephant house at the zoo. What are you doing here? I... I just wanted to sleep, that's all. You're lucky you weren't stepped on in that hay. One of them might have rolled right over on you during the night. During the night? Yeah. Yeah, I was here all night. They might have killed me. I got a good mind to call the cops and turn you in. No, 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 please don't do that. I'm broke. I, I, I couldn't go anyplace else. Give me a break. If I find a job, I'll be okay. All right. Now get out of here and stay out. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I'll get a job. I'll be all right. Job, eh? Why didn't you do that yesterday instead of hopping that freight? They won't know about the freight if I get a job. If a guy killed somebody, the cops wouldn't expect to find him looking for a job. Two hours sleep in there. That wasn't much. It was enough. I'm I'm young, I'm strong. You're running again, kid. You're running again. <laughs> Oh, just a minute, lady. Let me check the air in this rear tire. It looks low. Ah, she's all right now. Thanks. And hurry back. Hello? Hello. What can I do for you? Oh, what's chances I'd get a job around here? If you mean right here in this service station, the chances are nothing flat. Why not? The sign says you're open 24 hours a day. I work 12. My brother-in-law works the other 12. We don't need any help. I, I ain't asking much, and you could both cut down on your hours. Look, brother, I know it's tough, but I got troubles of my own. I'm barely making a living myself. Here, here. Here's two bits for something to eat. That's all the help I can give you. I ain't asking for a handout. I want a job. If my clothes were better, would that change your mind? Even if the morning paper said you'd been elected one of the ten best-dressed men in Hollywood, the answer would still be no. I haven't got enough to do myself. Well, suppose I get better clothes. Will you talk to me again? I'm a registered Democrat. I'll talk to anybody. But I'm not hiring. I'll, I'll be back when I get better clothes. What's your name? It's there right over the station. Hook. Oscar Hook. Thanks, Mr. Hook. Just got an idea I can talk myself into a job. Well, don't waste your time. Here, take the two bits. All right, thanks. I'll work it out for you when I come back. Stop trying to shove me out of my own business. <laughs> Good luck, kid. Thanks. I wondered when you were going to think about that, Lucky. Think about what? The clothes. So they're dirty, so what? Not all clothes get dirty that way. Where'd that coal dust come from? From the freights. What does that prove? Well, don't you know there isn't much coal brought into Southern California? That car may be the only one in six months. And I was killed on it, Lucky. Better think of something else, kid. You better think of something else. I'll get rid of these clothes. I'll, I'll get others. That won't be easy. Lots of people have seen you in those clothes. I told you how cops worked. Coal dust on your clothes, and there was coal dust on mine. I got it all over me, too. And you got no money to buy new duds. I'll get him. I'll go down to the cheap store. Somebody will trust me. Maybe. But the cops will be looking for somebody with coal dust on his clothes. They'll check the stores. You'll be easy to remember, Lucky. You'll be very easy to remember. I'll pick a small store. They, they can't check them all. They can't check them all. <laughs> In a moment, Act Two of Dead Man. But first, a word from our sponsor. This, of course, the middle commercial. After which, now we return to Act Two of James M. Kane's Dead Man, with Humphrey Bogart as Larry Knott and William Tracy as Lucky. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yes, senor. What can I do for you? Mister, will you trust me for a pair of white pants and a shirt? No, no trust. You want credit, you go to a bank. You go out and work. You get money to buy things. Look, lady, I want to work. And I can get a job if I have that outfit. I can start to work Monday morning. All I need is white pants and a shirt. I have to pay cash myself. No trust. Don't you understand? This means a job for me. I got to get that out there. I'll pay you next Saturday as soon as I get paid. Honest. Look, I would like to help you, but I can't do it. Okay, it's your store. I've been out of work a long time. What kind of job you going to get? Why you need white shirt and pants? Maybe he's going to drive an ice cream truck. Huh? No, no it's, it's a gas station. They got a rule. You got to have white clothes before you can work there. Yeah, they all wear white clothes. Ah, white clothes put the grease in the trucks. Eh, one day you're going to look worse than you do now. Look, what else would I want an outfit like that for? Holy smokes, my own things are better for the road, ain't they? I don't look like I own a yacht, do I? Tell me, where's this gas station you're going to work? Eh? Hollywood. A guy named Oscar Hook owns the place. It's an Acme station. You don't believe me? You call him up and ask him. Hollywood's the other side of town. How'd you get over here? I walked. All the way over from there to get stuff for the job? That's a long walk. Why'd you pick my store? I asked half a dozen places. Somebody's got to have a heart. When a young man doesn't go to school or to work, he's getting into trouble. What size you wear? Fifteen shirt, twenty-eight waist on the pants. Ah. Uh... All right, all right. Go into the back room, take off your clothes. I bring the stuff. Thanks. He'll need shoes, too. His are worn out. Here. See, see. Maybe he's hungry, too. Put a dollar in the pants. Well, why not fifty dollars? Make him a full partner in this store. Go, go, go. Uh, here's your things. You want to wrap up the old ones? No. No, throw them away. You, uh, you got pretty dirty. You're covered with black? Uh, yeah, I did some work uh, yesterday. I cleaned out a big fireplace in the restaurant for something to eat. Uh, you all ready now? Yeah, yeah, these are swell. I'll fix up a bill for you. Here you are, $9.84. Yes, yeah, and, and $1 service charge. Service charge? What kind of... All right, okay. Never mind the service charge. Sure, sure, forget the service charge. There's a tag or something in his pocket here. It's... Oh, it's... It's a dollar. Ah, that's all right. You find it, you keep it. It's your lucky day, huh? Yeah. Yeah, my lucky day. Here, yeah, mamacita. You burn the old clothes with the papers, huh? Sure, sure. Goodbye, boy. We pray for you. Goodbye, and, and thanks. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Adios. I'm all right now. I'm clear. Yeah, but what about the old clothes? I left them. I'm rid of them. Sure, but somebody else has them now. That's the evidence, kid. He noticed the dirt. They're going to burn them. That's what they said. You won't see them do it, though. How are you going to know? Uh, I'll go back. I'll go back and get him. No, you can't. That'd look funny. You said you didn't want them. I, I, I changed my mind. I'll burn them myself. Where? You got a private apartment? Someplace where you can turn a key? Look kind of funny building a fire in an empty lot to burn clothes. I they might think he was faking about the job. They'll burn him, they said so. Sure, they'll burn him. Walk a little faster, kid. Walk a little faster, kid. Well, you're persistent, kid. I'll say that for you. I went to a lot of trouble to get these clothes. There must be some way you can use me. Kid, look. Look at the dough in this cash box. Eleven bucks. And that's for two families to feed. The night shift won't bring that. It won't slice any thinner. Well, I guess you're right. Say, why don't you hit north? This town's dead right now. You could earn a living picking fruit up there. Yeah, it'd be great in the road in this white outfit. I can get you a ride in a line haul truck. Guy I know drives that route tonight. He'll leave about seven o'clock. They like company to keep them awake. But that means you have to stay awake, too. You look tired. Maybe you got a place I could lay down until then. Not here. 
You got any dough? A buck. There's a cheap hotel a few blocks up. Sack in there and sleep till just before seven. Okay, I'll see you later. No job after all, huh, Lucky? Now you got to run for it. Get out of town. They can't tag me. I got a head start now. Don't see how you figure that. There's cops up north, too. Already there, waiting. Guys on the road get picked up all the time. I look all right. They'll pass me. Sure. You traded black clothes for white ones. The cops will know about that when you don't show up to give the storekeeper his dough. If I stay here, they'll pick me up easier. I got to go. I got to take the chance. Sure. That's the only chance you got. Run. Get some sleep, then run. Well, you have, bud. I want a room. You can call me at 6.30 tonight. That's half a buck. Sign this card. What's the matter, bud? You forget your name? No. No, I just haven't written in a long time. I haven't even heard anybody say it. Except for my nickname. You can't take nicknames. Sometimes the cops come by, they want to see the list. Cops! What for? Who knows? They got to look like they're doing some kind of work, don't they? No matter, cops worry you? No, no. Why should they? Well, it's something you know better than me. Yeah. Is he changed from the buck in your key? Okay. That's my name. Ben Fuller. Where's the room? Straight down the hall. Room 13. Ain't superstitious, eh? No. Going down to the church to help decorate for tomorrow. You want to come? No! We used to go always. I'm not remember? going anymore. I'm sick of this place. I'm sick and tired. You shouldn't feel like that. You have a nice home and a nice job. Yeah, working in a hardware store in a hick town. I want to go places and see things. I want to be somebody. You are somebody, Ben. You've got friendship and respect. You won't always work for somebody else. You'll build something of your own someday. You bet I will. But it won't be here. Someday I'll go away. Someday I'll live in a big city where things happen. And I'll have everything I want. I want you to have everything, son. I want to help you. Won't you come with me? No, I told you, no! All right, son. All right. Hello, Lucky. <laughs> No, no, wait, Mom. Wait, I'll come with you. Too late, Lucky. You can't go now. I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't. You never wanted to hurt anybody, but you did. Even your mother. That's a lie. Is it, Lucky? Maybe it is. Maybe she deserved it, expecting a smart kid like you to run away in a dead little town. It wasn't dead. It was a good town. We had a basketball team and a band that played in the park in the summer and, and a lake where we could swim. Yeah, but that was for kids, not for a man. Father wasted his life there, too, didn't he? No, he didn't. He was the best barber in town. Everybody loved him. Everybody. That wasn't good enough for you, though. What did you want, Lucky? I don't know. I... What's that noise? It's pretty plain. Listen to it. What are they, what are they doing? What are they building? A gallows, Lucky. That's where they're going to hang you. You're not going to see it? I'll kill you, not I'll kill you. You already did. You can't do it again. You can't get rid of me. I, I'll kill you. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. I'll hey, kill you. Wake up, wake up. Oh. oh, just a minute. I'd hate to have you for a customer at night, bud. What are you doing, throwing a fit? I was dreaming, that's all. Dreams like that you can have. Come on, it's 6.30. Ain't you going to catch a truck or something? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I'll check out right away. I'm getting a ride north. Book 
says you're going north to pick fruit. Is that right? Only till I get enough dough to buy a new suit and a train ticket home. I want to go right back. Sure. Can't go back on the bum. I never should have left. Yeah, most guys I carry feel that way. But they never know till they try. Some of them start back too late. What do you mean? Ah, health is gone or they're getting a one-way jam. Hey, uh, I got to make a stop here for a few minutes, you mind? We ain't even out of town. I know, but I got to stop here. Hey, what are you stopping here for in the police station? What's the idea? Cops after you for something? No, no, of course not. Well, what are you so jumpy for? Well, they pick you up for vagrancy, uh, hitchhiking or something. Yeah, relax. They don't bother anybody. They're glad to see you go. Well, it just seemed a funny place to stop, that's all. Well, the police station ain't the only place on the block. I'm just going in that cafe across the street for a cup of java. This is a long haul, and I'm broke, and I got a tab in there. I'd uh, buy you a cup of coffee, only, well, it's, when it's on credit, it's kind of rubbing it in to bring a guest. I'll wait. Go ahead. Hey, uh, there's a mission house just the other side of the police station. You can get coffee in there for nothing. No, I'll, I'll wait. Uh, I don't blame you. They play music in the place, and it's murder. Oh, uh, there's an evening paper on the shelf behind the seat if you want to look at it while I'm gone. You can turn on the cab light. Paper? Uh, yeah, that's, that's good. Thanks. What are you looking for, Lucky? What? I'm just looking at the paper, that's all. I'm not a very important guy. Maybe it wouldn't be on the front page. Ah, there it is, Lucky. Page three. L or not. Railroad man killed. Read it, kid. The decapitated body of L.R. Knott, railroad detective assigned to a northbound freight, was found early this morning on a track about 15 miles north of Los Angeles. It is believed he lost his balance while passing another train and fell beneath the wheels. I don't know. We don't know. No, kid. Only you and I know. You can't know. You can't know anything. You're a dead man. You got no head in your body. You can't talk. You're my imagination, that's all. You mean conscience, don't you? Get away. You can't come back now. You're dead. You don't know anything. I'm free. I'm free. You don't know anything. All right, Lucky. I don't know. You've beaten the law, Lucky. They can't catch you. Nobody knows now. Nobody but you. You win, don't you, kid? I'm a dead man. You win, don't you, kid? I'm a dead man. You win, don't you, kid? I'm a dead man. the road now. We are... Hey, what's the matter? You sick or something? No. No, I'm all right. Well, if you are, you can climb up on the shelf and lay down. I changed my mind. I'm not going with you. Thanks, anyhow. Suit yourself, kid. So long, mister. So long, mister. Precinct House, Sergeant Jameson. Yeah, okay, Joe. Make out a report on it. Now, what can I do for you, boy? I want to give myself up. What'd you do, kid? Steal something? Or are you trying to get a free ride home? No. I... I killed a man. When did it happen? Last night. Where? On the railroad tracks going north. It was like this. Wait a minute, kid. Wait till I get a card. Okay, what's your name? 
Fuller. Ben Fuller. No middle name? They call me Lucky. Lucky, huh? Like in good luck? Yes. Lucky. Like in good luck. Humphrey Bogart will be back with you in just a moment. But first, here you would have a closing commercial. After which, here again is Humphrey Bogart. Next week, a story by the big fellow himself, Ernest Hemingway. And in weeks to come, other great yarns by John P. Marquand, Stephen Vincent Benet, John O'Hara, Louis Bromfield, Christopher Morley, James Thurber, James Gould Cousins, Ben Heck, Irvin Cobb, Thomas Wolfe, and other great names published in the Charles Grayson anthology, Stories for Men. Tonight's story was adopted for radio by Joel Mercott. The music composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. D. Engelbach, directed and produced for Santana Productions. Until next week when we meet again, good night. again next week at the same time when Humphrey Bogart will return to present another great short story, this time by one of the foremost men of contemporary fiction, Ernest Hemingway. This is High Aberback speaking. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre, presented by Camel Cigarettes. But, Countess, are you sure you want to put all your winnings on a single card? Absolutely sure, my dear Duke. Well, I don't know how it is in Russia, but here in Paris, it is very seldom that anyone wins on three cards in succession. The game of Pharaoh is the same in Russia as anywhere else. But I wish to put the whole amount, 400,000 francs, on my next card. As you wish, madame. I will deal. I have won. No. Look, I have won. See, Duke, you were wrong. Yes, I was wrong. Heavens. What's the matter? Each week at this time, Camel Cigarettes bring you Peter Lorre in the excitement of the great stories of the strange and unusual of dark and compelling masterpieces culled from the four corners of world literature. Tonight, The Queen of Spades by Alexander Pushkin. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre. Brought to you by Camel Cigarettes.
Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking camels than ever before. Yes, just leave it to your T-Zone to judge. Your T-Zone, that's T for taste and T for throat, is your true proving ground for any cigarette. See if Camel's rich, full flavor doesn't get highest rating with your taste. And if Camel's cool mildness isn't more than welcome to your throat. See if you don't find, like millions of other smokers, that Camel's suit your T-zone to a T. The story I'm about to tell you, you may not believe, but I assure you it actually happened. Now, the whole thing started one night when a group of young officers were having a game of cards at the rooms of Narumov of the horse guard. There were five of us there, including a lieutenant in the engineers named Hermann. He was the son of a German who had become a naturalized Russian, and he was an ambitious young man of strong passions and imagination, which he held in check by an even stronger will. Thus, though a born gambler at heart, Hermann never touched a card, for he considered his financial position did not allow it. Oh, I remember that night. At about four in the morning, we all sat down to supper. Oh, I'm not right. hungry. <laughs> How did you make out, Surin? Ah, uh, I lost. You always lose, Surin. You must be very strong-minded to be so consistent. <laughs> well, <it's wrong. laughs> you think he is strong-minded? How about yourself, Herman? Yes. Me? Why me? Uh, you never held a card in your hand or made a bet. And yet you sit here until four o'clock in the morning watching us play. <laughs> well, Tomsky, you see, gambling interests me. It interests me very much. In fact, I, I'm a gambler at heart, but I'm not in a financial position to sacrifice the necessary in a hope for winning the superfluous. In other words, I cannot afford it. <laughs> well, that doesn't explain anything. We none of us can afford it. Oh, Hermann's easy enough to understand. He's of German de descent, therefore he's thrifty. Right. Now, it's my grandmother, the Countess Fedotovna, who baffles me. You know, she won't gamble either. Oh, lots of grandmothers don't gamble. St. Petersburg is full of them. Ah, <laughs> yes, but they don't know the secret my grandmother knows. Huh? Secret? What kind of secret does she know? Something we'd all of us give a lot to possess. Huh? Yeah, a combination of three cards that can't fail to win at the faro table. Hmm? Oh, there's no such thing. What are you trying to tell us? Oh, let's go home. It's wait, late. wait, Tomsky, I'd like to know more about the secret. <laughs> what do you care, Herman? You don't gamble. Still, I'd like to hear about it. All right. Many years ago, when my grandmother was a lot younger, she went to Paris. Oh, she must have been quite a sensation. The Muscovite Venus, they called her. Anyway, she gambled at Faro with the Duke of Orléans. Lost a great deal of money, much more than she could pay. Yeah, who does? Come on, keep quiet, will you? <laughs> well, there was at that time a Count Saint-Germain in Paris. Yes. A mysterious figure that no one knew much about. Or be that as it may, he revealed to my grandmother... The secret of the three winning cards. Yeah. And did she win? Uh, that night she played again with the Duke d'Orléans. Yeah. Played the three cards, one after the other, doubling her bet each time. Yeah. And all three won, and she recovered everything she had lost ten times over. Oh, a little hard on the Duke, don't you think? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, he dropped dead, I believe. It was a long time ago. Oh, come on, come on, Tomsky, go on with the story. Well, that's all there is. My grandmother never touched a card again. You mean she knows how to pick three winning cards in succession... And you haven't succeeded in getting the secret out of her? <laughs> That's the devil of it. She had four sons, one of whom was my father, and yet she would never reveal the secret to any of them. Though it wouldn't have been a bad thing for them. Or for you either. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've had enough. I'm going home. Well, I'll go along with you. All right, All right. come along. Tomsky, uh, tell me, this grandmother of yours, uh, Countess Fedotovna, does she live in St. Petersburg? Yes, with a ward of hers named uh, Lizavieta. Poor girl, she is supposed to be my grandmother's companion, but slave would be a better word for it. <laughs> your grandmother's a widow? Yes. Oh, now, don't get your hopes up, Herman. She's a bit too old for you. She's 86 if she's a day. Still, I, I should like to meet her. No, there's not much chance of it, I'm afraid. She doesn't go about much anymore. But I still should like to meet her. Yes, I, I should like to meet her very much. <laughs> Hello, Paul. 
Don't tell me my grandmother is here. No, but she's going to the embassy ball tomorrow. Tonight, I... I came alone. Oh, oh, oh. while the cat's at home, the mouse will play, huh? <laughs> What's this I've been hearing about you? About me? Mm, all very romantic, I understand. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, come, 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 Lizavieta. You can't tell me that you don't know about the mysterious officer who's been standing outside the house for the last two weeks. About the notes he hands you when you get into the carriage with my grandmother. About the letters he sends by the milliner's girl. Who told you? <laughs> Great friend of your officer. A lieutenant in the engineers named Hermann. Hermann. Oh, yes, I, I think I've heard of him. Is he nice? Oh, I like him very much. But he's a very determined young man and means to get what he wants. Personally, I wouldn't trust him. He has the profile of Napoleon and the soul of Mephistopheles. <laughs> oh, good evening, Kamsky. Good evening. Speak of the devil. Hello there, Hermann. Uh, Lizavieta, may I present Lieutenant Hermann? Mademoiselle. The man we were just talking about. Uh, Hermann, this is Lizavieta Ivanovna. It's my grandmother's ward. How do you do, Mademoiselle Lizavieta? How do you do, Lieutenant? Would you like to dance? Yes, I would like to. Good. See you later, Tomsky. Oh, this is paradise, Lizavieta. Holding you in my arms. Feeling your heart beat against mine. No, no, you mustn't say things like that. <laughs> People will hear you. They'll talk. I don't care. They're talking already. Why did you make up that story about your imaginary friend to tell Tom? <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't want him to know it was I. And, and I had to talk about you to somebody. I hope the Comtesse doesn't hear about it. Devil with her. It's not the Countess I'm in love with. It's you. Oh, Lizavieta, this... This is so wonderful, it... He makes up for all those nights I stood outside your house and... Look, there in the door. It's Contessa's coachman come to fetch me. Oh. I must go home. When am I going to see you again? I don't know. Oh, but this is horrible. My heart is burning with things I want to tell you, but I can never, never see you alone. There must be some way. There is a way. Yes, how? Take this. Oh, oh. This is the key to the Contessa's house. Oh, Lizaviet. Tomorrow night, we're going to the embassy ball. We'll be home at 2. If you let yourself into the house at about 11.30, all the servants will be asleep. Yes, I will. Oh, directly to the library. It's at the right end of the corridor at the top of the stairs. Wait for me there. Right end of the corridor. Oh, oh you sweet Lizaviet. I adore you. Where's the Countess' room? At the other end of the corridor. Why do you ask me that? I don't want to get into the wrong room by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but now I must go. Till tomorrow night at two o'clock. Au revoir, chérie. Mademoiselle, good night. Good night, my child. Contest, are you sure there's nothing you want me to do for you? No, nothing, thank you, Lizavieta. I think I will just put my jewels away and sit quietly a while by myself. Good night. Good night. Uh, I am so tired. So very tired. I am too old to go. What's that? Don't be alarmed, madame. Oh, oh, are please you? don't be alarmed, Countess. I, I have no intention of harming you, but please. How oh, did you get in my bedroom? I have been waiting behind that curtain, waiting just for a chance to ask you a favor. A favor? Yes, of me? Yes, a favor of you, madame. You can ensure the happiness of my life. It'll, it'll cost you nothing. I don't know who you are, but you're mad. No, I'm not. I, I happen to know that you can name three winning cards in order. And... Oh, that, uh... That was a joke. No, it was not a joke. Oh, oh I can see it by your expression, madame. I, madame, I want you to tell me those three winning cards I do. No, no. But whom are you keeping that secret for, huh? Your grandsons, they are rich enough without it. Besides, they, they don't know the value of money, but I, I do. I, your cards will not be thrown away. Huh? No, no. It is a curse. 
things, Death. I'll chance that. Of, of what use is it to you? Or is it connected with some terrible sin or, or some bargain with the devil, huh? I'm ready to take your sins upon my soul, only please, please reveal the secret to me. No. Please. But I did. You. You won't have. I'll make you answer. No, I want no. You. you have my happiness in your hands. No. I'll take you to... Let go, you, my Lord. You won't speak. I'll no. make you... No. you. I'll... She won't tell me. She won't tell me. I'll... Are you all right? I heard voices. Comtesse. It is everything. You. Yes, it is I. But I don't understand. Where's the Comtesse? There she is. Contest, what's the... It's no use. She, she's dead. Uh, yes, dead. She's taking with her the one thing I wanted in the world. Without which I, I don't want to face life. You killed her? Yes, but, but you're not going to say anything to her. <gasps> no one knows I was in the house except you. You can't tell because you gave me the key. But you killed her? Yes, yes, I killed her. I killed her. She, she deserved to die. But now, now I'll never know her secret. Never, no one, no one will ever know her secret. Of, <laughs> unless she, unless she comes back to, to tell it to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> In a few moments, Mr. Peter Lorre will bring us the climax of tonight's mystery in the air when camels present Act Two of The Queen of Spades. Experience is the best teacher. Remember the wartime cigarette shortage? Who doesn't? One thing about it, though, smokers who went through it really learned a lot about cigarettes. They had first-hand experience with many different brands. How true. Goodness, we certainly smoked whatever brands we could get in those days. I smoke so many different brands, I'm practically a walking encyclopedia about cigarettes. Well, I'm a camel smoker now. And believe me, I know camel's a cigarette for me, because I've compared so many brands. Yes, yeah, smoking whatever brands they could get during the wartime cigarette shortage made people everywhere experts on judging the differences in cigarette quality. That experience convinced a host of smokers that they preferred the rich, full flavor and cool mildness of camels. Result? More people are smoking camels than ever before. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel yourself. Something about bruises on her throat. Oh, no, no. No, nothing to it, no. The doctor said she could have inflicted those herself oh? when she had trouble breathing. Hello, Tomsky. My condolences. Oh, thank you for coming, Herman. That's very nice of you. You never met my grandmother, did you? No, I didn't, but uh, that's no reason I shouldn't show my respect after all. You're my friend. I beg your pardon, but would you gentlemen care to view the remains before the services commence? I suppose I should, anyway. Oh, yes, by all means. I'll come, too, if, uh, if you don't mind. Not at all. Thank you. Come along. Doesn't she look peaceful? Poor old girl, I was fond of her. Wait. Wait, did you see that? What? See what? Look. One of her eyelids moved. What? I tell you. Come on, be quiet. But I saw it. Her, her eyelids moved as, as if she winked at me. That, as if she... She winked. Oh, he's fainting. Ah, a fine example of an army officer. Fainting at a funeral. No, oh, maybe he's sick. Come on, help me carry him out of here. Never get to sleep. My, my conscience won't let me. Oh, why did I do it? Why, why did I go to that cursed funeral just, just because my conscience said you are the murderer of that old woman? I, I wanted to implore her pardon, but, but she winked at me. I, I could swear it. She did. <laughs> Who's there? Oh, who, who? You do not recognize me. Uh, you have a short memory. Come to see. I have come back from the beyond against my wishes. 
I have been ordered to grant your request. Grant my request? Yes. Three, seven, and ace will win for you if played in succession. Three, seven, and an ace. But only on these conditions. Anything, anything at all. you do not play more than one card in 24 hours. And that you never play cards again during the rest of your life. All right. I promise, I promise. Three, seven, and an ace. <laughs> Three, seven, and an ace. Oh, I must remember it. Three, seven, ace. Three, seven, ace. <laughs> Are you all right? All right. Uh, yes, sir. All right. Yes, I'm all right. Oh, that's good. We were worried about you. We hadn't seen you since you collapsed at my grandmother's funeral. Oh, oh, oh. that was terrible, Lieutenant. And an officer shouldn't faint. I, I hope you'll forgive me for what happened yesterday. Oh, that's all right. Could have happened to anyone. Oh. But it wasn't yesterday, you know. Hmm? It was the day before. The day before. No, I don't remember that. <laughs> You must have been pretty sick to lose a whole day like that. What got into you? Tomsky, uh, will you do me a favor? Uh-huh, if I can, what is it? I've heard a lot about a certain Chekolinsky and, and the gambling that goes on at his house every oh, night. Oh, yes. And... Chekolinsky has practically spent his whole life at the card table. That's what I heard. Oh, he's amassed millions at it, but what... I should like to go there. Oh, you want to watch them play Faro at Chekolinsky? No, I want to play. You want to play? Yes. <laughs> What's happened to you, Herman? I thought you couldn't afford to gamble. Yes, but now I can. I, you see, I, I have a little legacy left uh, from my father. And Congratulations. I feel I'm in luck. Uh, when can you take me? Any time. Tonight? Yes, if you feel up to it. Good, that's very good. <laughs> we'll go to Chekolinsky's tonight, huh? Honestly, I have never seen such a magnificent establishment. Never, never in my life have I seen such a place. It's, well, it's all paid for by fellows like you who felt they were in luck. <laughs> Look, there's Chukalinsky at the faro table. Where? Oh. Come on over, I'll introduce you. But don't say I didn't warn you. Good evening, Tomsky. Chukalinsky, hmm? I want you to meet a friend of mine, Lieutenant Herman. Uh, Herman? This is the famous Chekolinsky. Good evening. Oh, shanty. Uh, Herman seems to feel particularly fortunate tonight. Do you suppose he could sit in and take a card? A friend of yours? <laughs> but of course. Good luck, Herman. Thanks. Will you be kind enough to select your card, please? Thank you. This is my card. And how much would you like to bet, Lieutenant? I would like to bet 47,000 rubles. <laughs> Forgive me, Lieutenant, but we only play for cash. It's quite all right. I, I have it. Money's right here. Are you crazy, Herman? You're playing pretty high, Lieutenant. Nobody here has ever staked anything like that on one card before. Well, do you accept it or don't you? I accept it. Then if you'll be kind enough to deal. As you wish. Nine, three... Herman has one. One. Look, his card is a three. Well, congratulations, Lieutenant. Uh, do you want me to settle with you now? If you please. Uh, here you are. 47,000 rubles. No. Would you like to try again? No. Not tonight, but tomorrow night I'll be back to try another card. Well, Lieutenant, what do you want to wager tonight? Same stake as last night, plus my winnings, 94,000 rubles. Just as you say. You have picked your card. I will deal. Knave, seven. Look! Look, Herman's won again. The card is open. There you are. 94,000 rubles. Thank you, sir. I shall see you again tomorrow night. Yes, sir, 
be here tonight. I don't believe he'll show up. He'd be a fool to Here he comes now with Tomsky. Now, he can't win three times in a row. He's just impossible. Gentlemen, gentlemen, quiet, please. Well, Lieutenant Hermann, how much do you wish to bet tonight? Same stake plus my winnings. Here it is. 180,000 rubles. What? On one card? Yes. On one Herman, card. don't you think that... that... Please be quiet, Tom. I know what I'm doing. Gentlemen, please. Will you choose your card, Lieutenant? I have it. Will you please deal? Queen. Ace. <laughs> I win again. Ace wins. Here it is. Huh? If you'd been holding an ace, you would have won. But you haven't an ace. You have a queen, and it loses. What do you mean? What I... <laughs> you weren't holding an ace, my dear fellow. You have the queen of spades. Queen? Look. Look queen at it yourself. Queen of spades? What? It is impossible. I have... Uh... Yes, it is. Yes, it is the queen of spades. <laughs> now I see it, but... Look it. Oh, it isn't the Queen of Spades. It's, it's the Countess. Look, see the resemblance? <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, she's tricked me. She's deliberately tricked me. What oh, are you your talking grand, about? Your grandmother. Your grandmother, the Countess. She told me three, seven, and eight. She told you? Yes, she But oh, you never met her. I did meet her. I waited for her one night in her bedroom, and I pleaded with her. But she refused to tell me. She refused to tell me her secret. And then I took her by the throat. And you killed her, huh? You took her by the throat and yes, strangled her. I killed her, yes, but she didn't tell me that. But then one night she came back. She came back from the grave, and she told me three cards. It was seven. And But she lied. She lied to me. Oh, that dirty woman. She's got no revenge. I, I've lost all the money I had in the world, but I, I don't care anymore. But I'll, what? I'll show her. What? I'll, I'll, I'll let go! You murder the countess. You'll hang for that. Let them hang me. Let them hang me. I'll get even with her. Beyond the grave, I'll get even with her. man. <laughs> I'll be glad when they hang me. I'll be glad when they hang me. But they didn't hang him. He's spending the rest of his life in room 17 of the Obukhov Hospital. He never answers any question, but constantly Three, mutters the same seven, things. Eight. Three, seven, eight. and three camels to service men's hospitals from coast to coast. This week, the camels go to Veterans Hospital, American Lake, Washington, U.S. Army and Navy General Hospital, Hot Springs, Arkansas, U.S. Naval Hospital, Brooklyn, New York, U.S. Marine Hospital, Detroit, Michigan, and Veterans Hospital, Perry Point, Maryland. There are many doctors among America's millions of camel smokers. In fact, according to a nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. This survey was made by three leading independent research organizations who questioned 113,597 doctors living in every state of the Union. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand named most was Camel. Next week, Mystery in the Air... Starring Mr. Peter Lorre, brings you one of the greatest American classics of all time, The Black Cat by Edgar Allan Poe. From B.C. Listen again next week at this same time when the makers of Camel Cigarettes present Mr. Peter Lorre in Mystery in the Air. The artists supporting Mr. Lorry tonight were Henry Morgan, Loreen Tuttle, Peggy Weber, Ben Wright, Louis Van Ruten, Stanley Waxman, Jack Edwards Jr., and Rolf Sedan. This is Michael Roy in Hollywood wishing you all a pleasant good night for Camels.
This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Strange Creatures Gruesome Murders oozing organisms, unfathomable abductions, enigmatic expeditions, an age-old malevolence, and much more. Author J.C. Moore delivers a collection of dark horror tales that are both chilling and poignant. Dark Intrigues Book One is filled with horror fiction for fans of short story anthologies, horror collections, ghost fiction, suspense, possession, and more. Dark Intrigues Book One by J.C. Moore, available on Kindle or as an audiobook narrated by Darren Marlar. Find Dark Intrigues Book One on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. of the Mystery Playhouse. Would you like to hear the story of a mad killer who murdered with one hand while holding the Bible in the other? Sound intriguing, huh? Well, if it does, stay with us for the next 30 minutes as we bring you an exciting mystery tale by Jerome and Hal Prince. These talented brothers have evolved a strange and stirring story that should keep you on the edge of your seats throughout. So settle yourselves in them. Now as we raise the curtain on the man in a velvet hat. The beginning, New York City. An office building in the financial district just off Wall Street. Sometime after closing hours, Tuesday night, December 15th. An office Christmas party for out-of-town salesmen. The party is being held on the 19th floor in room 1906. in this corridor. How do you like that? Where's that night bell for that elevator? Mm-hmm. Ah, where's that elevator? Doorbell indicator. Where, 
Well, here's the elevator right here. Just open the door and... Sudden death in an elevator shaft. That was at 11 p.m. Tuesday, December 15th. Nine hours later, 8 a.m. Wednesday, December 16th, a letter is delivered to John Reynolds, the ranking New York newspaper columnist. Here's a screwy letter, Mike. My dear Mr. Reynolds, it was my whim two hours ago to take home with me to eternity my son, known in this life as Fred Smith. Well, what do you know about that? Was it signed? No, but look. Capital M on my and me. Just as though the guy writing the letter thought that... that he was God. Hey. Yeah? I just think I'll put in a routine check. See if any guy named, what is it, uh, Fred Smith was knocked off in the last couple of hours. The following day, December 17th, at a downtown hotel... That's a lousy note, hardly a week before Christmas. Poor devils. Five dead, the chief figured. All from some dope who has to smoke cigarettes in bed in a flyer trap flea bag of a hotel. Mike. Yeah? Mike, look. Another letter. Listen. My dear Mr. Reynolds, five have been purified by flames... And are at peace within my heart. Hey. Mike, have you any word of any big fires today? Why, yeah, there was a three-alarmer in a hotel downtown, just east of Broadway. One day later, December 18th. It is night. Second Avenue is wet and slippery with rain. Then... What happened? Dear Mr. Reynolds, in a swift chariot, I have taken Edward Tucker home to glory. No signature. The third in three days, and if it's like the others, it's on the beam. This looks like a story. The following day, December 19th, John Reynolds sets out to investigate. I'm Reynolds of the New York Dispatch. Is this the building where Fred Smith was killed four days ago? That's right. Were you on the night elevator the night Smith fell down the shaft? Yep. Drunk as a coot, he must have been. Listen to me. On the night that Smith was killed, did you take anybody up to that office Christmas party who didn't belong there? A stranger? No, sir. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. Now, look. See this $50 bill? Fifty bucks? Gee. Go on, take it. It's yours. Gosh. Now come clean. Who was the stranger? Hmm? Oh, uh... Maybe you mean the tall guy who came in at a, a quarter to 11. That's the one. Well, uh, I tell him the party's on the 19th floor. He doesn't answer, just nod. So I take him to the 19th and I let him out. What'd he look like? Ah, oh, you got me, Mr. Reynolds. I didn't... You must have seen his hat. What kind of a hat did he wear? Hmm? Oh, uh, yeah. Black. Uh, it was old and uh, fuzzy. Fuzzy, like... Old velvet? If you say so, Mr. Reynolds. If I say so, no. Was it like velvet? Okay, Mr. Reynolds, okay. A velvet hat. Yeah, a man in a velvet hat. You were one of the firemen working in that fire in this hotel. Was there anything suspicious? Just a guy smoking a cigarette in bed. That's suspicious. Your accent. Did you happen to see a man in a black velvet hat hanging around outside the ropes when the fire was blazing? Black velvet hat. That's it. Black velvet hat. It was raining that night. And... Sure it was. Yeah. There was a guy. And he was wearing a black velvet hat. Do you remember, Fireman? Do you remember? <laughs> Madam, they tell me you were a witness to that auto crash down the street last night. That's right. What about it? Was anybody else around last night when that car slammed into the pillar? What if there was? Look, did you happen to know who the man driving that car was? He was Edward Tucker, who was champion midget auto driver. Now, it wouldn't be easy for him to lose control of his car. 
It was wet. It had been raining. Sure, sure. Now, now tell me, were there any other witnesses around? A man. A man. He must have been wearing a... Well, a raincoat and a hat. A hat. What? Do you remember what kind of a hat he was wearing? Was it... Was it dark? Dark? Yeah. Almost black, yes. Maybe kind of fuzzy? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, fuzzy. Almost like it was, uh, velvet. Yeah. A velvet hat. <laughs> And in John Reynolds' column in the New York Dispatch the next morning, December 20th. Three deaths. Three accidental deaths. But were they accidental? In every case, an eyewitness tells us of seeing a man in a velvet hat. An apparent madman. A man whose paranoia assumes the form of God's substitution. A man who writes letters claiming that deaths were caused by him. Are the police aware of the reign of this madman? And is the madman lying, or has he done murder? But if murder has been done, and if this man is a murderer, he's a murderer such as the world has never known. Or perhaps such as the world has always known, but never seen. There is no motive for any of his crimes, no evidence of lust or of envy, of passion or of gain. Certainly, if this man is not a god, he has not only successfully adopted the posturing of one... But the psychic attributes as well. Where he walks, death walks. This man may be death himself. And all New York reads John Reynolds' column and wonders. Then in the next three days come three more deaths, three more letters. And three more reports in John Reynolds' column telling of eyewitnesses seeing the man in the velvet hat at the scene of each crime. And now comes panic. A great city is hushed and frightened, waiting to see who is the next to die. Then on December 23rd, the climax. It was late afternoon at the office for the police commissioner. Chief Magruder confers with Detective Sergeant Martin. Well, I haven't much to report, Chief. This is the wackiest case I've seen. Never mind that. Get to the facts, Martin. What facts? So we're supposed to find a guy wearing a velvet hat, so we can't find anything. Where he lives, his name, nothing. This doesn't seem to exist. Perhaps he doesn't exist. Right? Yeah, well, tell it to New York City. Tell it to the newspapers. Hello? Now, oh, look, Chief, don't you think it would be better if we told the reporters that we've been getting the same letters that this columnist Reynolds has? Let them know we're at least half to what's going on. Yeah, perhaps Chief, you're right. Chief Magruder. Chief Magruder. Take it easy, Miss Martin. But it's happened again, the man in the velvet hat. What? Where? How? When? Crowded movie theater. A woman screamed and shouted, Look out, the man in the velvet hat. And there was a panic. Panic? Anybody killed? Sixteen. Sixteen dead. Maybe more. Sixteen. Good oh. Lord. Chief Magruder's office? Yes, sir. Just Look, Chief, I think I better go Chief out. Chief Magruder, it's the mayor. The mayor? Uh, uh, Martin, you stay here a minute. Yes, Mr. Mayor. How'd you hear about it so fast? Well, I suppose the newspapers will make a big... But I'm doing everything I can. Oh, Reynolds, eh? Well, why should he... Yes, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Goodbye. What goes, Chief? Plenty. Whole town is upside down. Relatives are jamming the morgue, trying to identify the dead. The Citizens Committee is planning a mass meeting tomorrow to demand action. Every newspaper in town is roasting the city administration. What do we do, Chief? You? you do nothing to hear from me. Miss Myers, my hat. Where are you going? To the mayor's office. The mayor and I and that columnist Reynolds are going to have a little conference. Reynolds? Yeah. The mayor seems to think Reynolds knows more about this thing than the police department. Answer me this, Magruder. Answer me this. Has there been a murder? Are these accidents murders? Maybe there aren't any murders, Mr. Mayor. Not in the ordinary sense. I believe there is, Magruder. Just a minute, Reynolds. Your Honor, except for the panic at the movie house, every death was accidental or natural, as sure as we three are in this room. What do you mean? What about the man in the velvet hat? Put the screws on some of the people who say they saw him, and he'd disappear like that. Forget it. To the people of this town, he's real. And this panic, cold panic, right in the middle of the holidays. The people are scared blue. May I say something, Mr. Mayor? Well, certainly, that's why you're here. Look, the way I see it, 
Either it's all a hoax or there is a man in a velvet hat. That's right. So either prove the hoax or catch the man. All right. All right. I think we can do one or the other. If Reynolds will help. Well, certainly I'll help. How? I'm going to challenge the man in the velvet hat, and Reynolds is going to publish that challenge. I'm going to say I don't think he's a god. I'm going to say I don't even think he's a good criminal. Anybody can boast of a murder after it's happened, but only a master criminal can boast of a murder before it's happened and get away with it. I'm going to challenge him to name his next murder before it happens. And Reynolds will publish my challenge. Okay, Magruder. But I predict that he'll accept your challenge and that when he does, you will not catch him. And in his newspaper column, December 24th, John Reynolds says... A challenge from the police commissioner of New York City to the man in the velvet hat. Quote, I challenge you to prove that you were a criminal. I think you're a fraud. If you're not a fraud, you will announce in advance the time and place of your next killing, murder, mercy, death, whatever you call it. Unquote. Hello, this is Reynolds of the dispatch. Give me the commissioner. Please hurry. Well, just a minute, Mr. Reynolds. Hold on. Yeah? Magruder, Reynolds. Yeah, Reynolds. I got an answer from the man in the velvet hat. You got... What did he say? He says at precisely 9 o'clock p.m. on Christmas Eve, a man will die poisoned in front of the Times building on Times Square. He says, quote, After this, I will move again in silence, for only those without faith need signs. That's all. Nine o'clock Christmas Eve in front of the Times building by poison. That's what he says. Okay. Thanks. time is it now? It's uh, four minutes till nine, Chief. Four minutes, huh? It's darn cold out here. Why do they keep playing that same tune all the time? That was popular two years ago. Did they write any new Christmas songs? Uh, it's a good song. Stop chattering each other, both of you guys. Tell your nerves to lie down. Oh, my nerves are all laying down and purring. All right, then, shut up. Keep your eyes on your watch. Now, let's see. Simon and Thompson in front of the Times building. Burke and Lamantia in the lobby. Rowan over there across the street on 7th Avenue and the whole homicide squad scattered all over the theatrical district. All right, I'd like to have doubled the number of guys standing around just in case. Now what's your nerves need to lie down, Chief? Precisely at 9 o'clock on Christmas Eve, a man will die poisoned in front of the Times building. Hey, Chief, where is the front of the Times building? Where we are here in Times Square, or maybe... Is it a block back there on 42nd Street? After this, I will move again in silence. For only those without faith need signs. Martin. Yeah? Have you got a good reason why he didn't type out his last note on a typewriter like he usually does? Why does he have to write this one in that Bible lettering? Search me. Maybe God maybe likes to write like the Bible. Yeah, and maybe I'll break you and send you out to Pound of Pea on Staten Island. How much time, Martin? Uh, less than 30 seconds if the guy is prompt and keeping his appointments. Hey, Chief. Huh? Look at that guy. See? Which guy? Standing over there on the curb on 7th Avenue. The guy has no hat on. He's got no coat on. He's carrying his coat under his arm. On a night like this, he's qualifying for the booby hatch. Here he comes. Watch him. He's coming through those cars. Keep your eye on him. He's coming right at us. Glory, hallelujah! He stopped. Yeah. Hey, hey, look at him. What's he doing? Swallowing poison, you fool. Grab him, quick. Stop that guy. Keep the crowd away. Keep him away. That is a doornail, Chief. Yeah. Isn't he, though? This is his coat, Chief. It's a brown raincoat. Inside out. Look. Look at it. Something in his pocket, huh? Well, I'll be... It's a velvet hat. Hey, Chief. Yeah? Here. Simon picked it up. Said he dropped it on the sidewalk just before he drank a poison. Give me it. It's a letter. His last. 
Let those without faith disbelieve now. You're quite a hero today, Chief Magruder. Hero, eh? <laughs> Here's John Reynolds' column. Did you read it? No, oh, let's see it. The people of New York City owe a vote of thanks to their police commissioner for his effective... That's right. As for the man in the velvet hat, he was clearly a religious fanatic. There were never any crimes. There were merely accidents. Then the man in the velvet hat sent his letters to both the police commissioner and your columnist, attempting to say he had caused these accidents. Finally, when challenged by Magruder to prove his existence, he poisoned himself rather than admit he was not possessed with supernatural powers. <laughs> nice open and shut case, eh, Miss Myers? Yes, sir. Oh, incidentally, the mayor wants you to call him. He wants to thank you personally. The devil with the mayor. Get that columnist John Reynolds on the phone. Tell him to get over here right away. I want to talk to him. <laughs> It was a queer case, Magruder, wasn't it? Not really knowing? Yeah. You know, I had the right hunch from the beginning. Kept it to myself, though. You know, it's an interesting study, lunacy. You think so? The funny thing, though, about the lunatic... I mean, you never did find out who he really was, did you? Now, look here, Reynolds. I had you pegged from the start. What do you mean you had me pegged from the start? You heard me. Now, now look here, Magruder... Are you implying the man in the velvet hat and I were working together? No. There never was a man in a velvet hat. You wrote those letters yourself. I wrote... Why should I? What... What motive could I have? Plenty. You write a newspaper column, don't you? You gotta keep it filled and get it read, don't you? Now, look. I'm an old-fashioned cop, Reynolds. I ask myself, who gains? In this case, you did. You created the man in the velvet hat out of whole cloth. You wrote his letters and mailed them to me. And through coercion, bribery, or suggestion, you convince a lot of witnesses they actually saw this phantom at the scene of each accident. This is a gag, a rib. You can't be serious. And maybe we found the typewriters you wrote the letters on, and maybe we didn't. You can be sure that if we haven't, we will. It's a beautiful theory, Magruder. But spoiled by an ugly fact. There was a man in a velvet hat. And you haven't. Dead. No, Reynolds. There wasn't any man in a velvet hat. What? How do you know? Because the man we found dead. The man who took his life in front of the Times building was released from an insane asylum only one day before you published my challenge. He couldn't have been the man in the velvet hat all those other times, not while he was in the asylum. Now, now look, Magruder. Don't let your theory run away with your head. You know darn well... Don't I... tell me what I know darn well. You wrote that biblical script. Then you got this poor fellow who killed himself on Times Square. You took advantage of his insanity to coerce him, cajole him, persuade him in some way to do what he did. You're out of your mind. Uh, Chief, uh, excuse me. What do you want, Kachowski? Well, Chief, here's the guy we're looking for. Second-hand typewriter store, man. In Brooklyn. That's the man. That's him. That's the man. What are you talking about? You're crazy. I tell you, seven or eight times he comes into my store, types something out, each time on a different typewriter. Always letters. Since he's trying them out. The man's lying. You never saw me. That's the man, all right. I, I remember him. That's okay, the... okay. Calm down. All right, Reynolds. What have you got to say now? Now, listen, McGrew, listen to me. When I began this whole thing, I never dreamed it you would You never it. dreamed it would cause the death of 16 people in a crowded theater. And the insane man you persuaded to take poison. That was murder, too, Reynolds. Murder? Well, they'll electrocute me. McGrew, you're the only one that knows. You can hush this up. Give me a break, will you? <laughs> well, what do you say? Look, I... I've got money. I'll make you a rich man. What do you say, Magruder? What do you say? I say you're gonna burn, Reynolds. You're gonna burn. Hey, my friends. We have the ingenious solution to tonight's mystery playhouse performance. The man in a velvet hat. And tomorrow, don't make up a man who wasn't there. You might end up in the electric chair. <laughs> Pardon me, please. Uh, the creep who writes this stuff twisted my arm. 
Well, we've just got time to look in on the green room where our players are rehearsing the next uh, bedtime story. Follow me, please. Come. Come, come. <laughs> Not to get hold of yourself, Geraldine. I can't help it, Doctor. You see, it starts every night about this time. What starts? The music. David's last composition. I hear it being played on a piano. And the notes seem to come from the old house, the house where David died in the fire. Well, perhaps someone is playing that piece on the piano. Someone on the island. No. No, there's only one other house out here, and those people are away. The dog. The dog keeps howling all night long. What dog? I don't know. There's no dog on the island, but David and I did have a dog. You remember? He stayed with David the night of the fire. He died with him because David was too ill to get out of bed. There! There it is again! Amazing. That's a real dog. Somewhere on this island. Why, of course. Probably some stray got across the bridge or swam over from the shore. Well, you see, I... Oh, excuse me, Doctor. Sir. Hello? Hello. This is Geraldine Reeves. Yes, speaking. Who is it? Listen. watch the bridge and see them coming. For heaven's sake, Charity. What are you staring at? The bridge, Doctor. The bridge, look. This end of it's been washed out. Hmm. Uh, something peculiar going on here, don't you think? I think that woman has good reason to be worried, too. Sounds to me like the beginning of just the kind of story we like around here. Nice and creepy, huh? Why, you'll have to wait until next time for the whole thing. That old scare master of ceremonies. The gory goon of the inner sanctum. A Raymond. Will be on hand. <laughs> so you'll be here too, huh? Won't you? When Raymond, the giggling ghoul, tells you the spine-tingling tale, voice on a wire. This is Peter Lorre, closing the doors of the mystery playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. This is the arm.
Armed Forces Radio Service. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or So Bad It's Good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. a common criminal, and I didn't mean it. You know I didn't. Oh, stop whining, Gerald. Take your medicine like a man. What? All right, Harvey. I'll stop. You're responsible for the whole thing. You know you are. And since they can only hang me once, even for two murders... Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in Death's Goblet. <laughs> Midnight. Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Sigmund Miller is Death's Goblet. It all began at one of Arthur Cunningham's parties. He always gave a party when he came back from one of his trips abroad. I went there with Gerald, my partner, and his wife, Susan. Beautiful Susan. Did I care for her? People used to say so. But she was too self-centered a woman for me. Now, I like to look at her just as I like to look at anything that's uh, lovely. That was all. As for Gerald, well, he was rich, which was the only reason he was my partner. But suppose I start at the beginning, at the moment we got to the party and Arthur came over. Well, hello, Harvey. Glad you came. Wonderful to see you back, Arthur. You know Gerald and his lovely wife, Susan? Of course. Hello, lovely wife, Gerald. It's nice to see you again, Arthur. Good trip, I think. Marvelous. And you're just in time for a drink. Hey, let's get away from this mob. Come into the study. Oh, oh, nice. I just opened my last bottle of Chateau Albert. Oh, nice. Here we are. Oh, well, someone get the glasses out of the cabinet, will you? <laughs> Mob <laughs> parties make me very nervous. You know, I'm much yeah. proud of you. Here we are. Yes. Hi. What an odd goblet this one is. Oh, uh... Put that one back, Susan. Why, what's wrong, Arthur? Uh, use any of the others, but not that one. Oh, I'll be careful of it, if that's what you're worried about. Well, it's not that. I just don't want you to drink from it. What's all the mystery about, Arthur? Well, you'd all think I was mad if I told you. Uh, take a look at it. It's a very strange-looking glass. Yes, looks uh, Venetian, possibly from Murano. It is. This red spot here on the side. Yes, it's supposed to be a drop of blood. Oh, that's very odd. How do you know that? 
Well, Gerald, this goblet has a legend, a terrible legend. And, of course, none of you will believe it, but the story is that anyone who drinks from this goblet will kill someone. Oh, that's wonderful. And you believe it? Why, yes, Gerald. You see, I've had proof. Good heavens. I, well, I once drank from this goblet. What? Arthur, you're joking. You mean that you... Yes, Susan, it was justifiable homicide, but after I drank from it... I did kill someone. He was a thief and he attacked me, but still I killed him. Well, you never told us about that. Well, it's not anything that I care to remember particularly. Oh, how terrible for you, Arthur. Where did you get the goblet? From a murderer. A man who killed his wife. They were auctioning off his estate. Hmm. Extraordinary. May I look at the glass, Arthur? Yes, if you like. Everyone stared at the goblet in silence as I held it to the light. It had a delicate brown tint, reminding me of old blood, except that it sparkled and glittered. The spot of red did look like a drop of blood about to roll down the side. It seemed ridiculous that this inanimate object could make men commit murder, and yet there was something about it that that fascinated me, and suddenly I wanted to drink out of it. You seem very interested in my goblet, Harvey. Yes, will you pour some wine in it for me? What? No, Harvey. This happens to be one superstition, I believe. Everyone who has ever put his lips to this goblet has killed. I don't know why it's so, but it is. Oh, it's silly, of course, but why tempt fate? Oh, nonsense, Gerald, nonsense. I'm going to drink out of it. You'll have to pour the wine yourself, Harvey. All right, I will. Well, here's, um, health and, uh, long life. No, Harvey, I won't let you... Oh, well, Susan... You shouldn't have done that. You've spilled some of Arthur's best burgundy and ruined a good tablecloth. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm glad you did it, Susan. I won't let you or anyone else drink from that glass. It's strange to get so distressed about a ridiculous legend. I don't think murder is ridiculous. You know, I'd like to get rid of it. I was thinking of destroying it. Well, why don't you? Just fling it against the fireplace. No, I can't. Huh? I've tried several times, but somehow I couldn't. Um, Arthur. Yes? How about uh, giving it to me? I'd rather not. Oh, come on. You want to get rid of it, and I have a fine glass collection. I, I'd, I'd like to add to it. I'll keep it locked up. You'll be sorry, but if you want it that badly, Harvey, it's yours. Arthur, please don't give it to him. Susan, what's the matter with you? You watch over Harvey as if... Well, as if... As if what, Gerald? Oh, the whole business is absurd. Of course it is. Yes, and if I should drink out of it and commit a murder, that would be the most absurd thing of all. <laughs> I kept the goblet on the mantelpiece in my library where the lamplight made it glitter. I discovered that the red drop was not paint. It was ingrained in the glass. Oh, very cleverly. One night, both Susan and Gerald were at my home. As we chatted, I got up, went to the mantelpiece, and idly toyed with the goblet. That goblet... It's the one Arthur gave. Yes, yes, you remember. He gave it to me. Why don't you smash it, Harvey? Get rid of it. Ooh, it gives us all the creeps. Mm. Well, Gerald, you aren't really afraid of a piece of glass, are you? You don't believe Arthur's story at all, do you, Harvey? On the contrary, Susan, I do believe it. But uh, not the way you think. What do you mean? Well, I mean to say murder is not in the goblet. It's in me, in you. Even in, in Gerald. Oh, what a silly thing to say, Harvey. Oh, yes. You don't need a magic goblet to commit a murder. All you have to do is let yourself go. Let go of the civilized controls that tie you up. Why, oh. Gerald, if you had cause, you could murder me or even your lovely wife. Oh, I couldn't kill a fly. Oh, but you could if the fly gave you enough trouble. Now, supposing, uh, just as an example, supposing that you discovered that Susan was really in love with me... And only married you for your money. <laughs> Wouldn't that make you want to murder her, Joe? Oh, you're crazy. That's not very funny, Harvey. Even you, Susan. What? Even though you have a lovely face and exquisite hands, even you could commit murder. Why, there must have been times when you hated Gerald, or only for a moment, of course. But in that moment, eh, in that moment, if you were not so civilized... Stop it, Harvey. Why, you could even put your lovely hands around my throat. Oh, stop it, Harvey. <laughs> You're not that important to her. And then just why are we on this gruesome subject? That's Harvey's idea of humor. Susan looked at me, a touch of red at the point where the cheekbones make the skin taut. She seemed angry, but she wasn't really. Oh, yes, she loved me. 
I could see it in her face. She looked at me for a moment and then dropped her eyes. May I look at the goblet, Harvey? No, I'm afraid not, Susan. You might accidentally drop it. It might be a good idea. Well, I have an even better one, Gerald. And that's to go home before we get really serious about this murder business. I sat there staring at the goblet after they left. It it fascinated me, glittering in the lamplight. And as I looked at it, it almost seemed as if the red spot of blood was uh, uh, moving, rolling down its side. Why, why shouldn't I drink from it? Why? And before I knew it, I'd taken it down and put it on the table. I got a bottle of burgundy, opened it, and I poured slowly, filling the goblet just up to the red spot. And then I drank from it. It seemed to me that the wine had a different taste, although I had drunk this wine often and knew its taste well. It was delicious. I had another. It was heady. And it made me a little dizzy, although I felt fine and, and, and free. Yes, light and dizzy. But, but after a while, when the dizziness wouldn't go away, I decided to go for a drive, even though it was close to midnight. I drove fast. The speed and power of the car gave me a feeling of great exhilaration. I took the turns at full speed, enjoying the danger of the sharp curves. Then I came to a long, level stretch of road. I pressed down hard on the gas. The needle of the speedometer slowly moved upward. Sixty, seventy, eighty, eighty-five. The road, like a black ribbon, rolled up in front of me. And then I suddenly saw him, but it was too late. I struck him with my right fender. He never made a sound. The car swerved a little from the impact. My heart in my throat. I stopped. Then I... I backed up. Then... up to where the body was lying sprawled grotesquely on the edge of the road. One look was enough. He was dead. But no one had seen the accident. I stepped on the gas and drove off. Death's Goblet and the man who drank from it, a corpse lying limp by the side of a lonely road, and the car speeding away as the clock strikes twelve for... Murder at midnight. to Murder at Midnight. Harvey challenged the curse of the goblet and found it true. He had just killed a man after drinking from it. Let's listen to him as he continues the story of Death's Goblet. I knew now that the story of the goblet wasn't a myth, and I also knew what I was going to do about it. The next night, I got Gerald to come to my house to do some work. Oh, oh, I can't make head or tail out of your cost estimates, Harvey. Oh, now, really, Gerald, it's very simple. Just concentrate. Oh, why can't you take care of it like a good fellow? I'm awfully tired. Well, all right, let's stop for a couple of minutes. Have a drink. Oh, what are you doing, Harvey? The goblet. Why, you don't really believe that story of Arthur's, do you? Well, you're much too intelligent for that. Mm-hmm. Well, you only pretended in front of Susan, didn't you? Well, I... <laughs> oh, yes, I had to pretend, you know, women. Well, of course. And even if you did believe it, I have a feeling that... Basically, you're pretty reckless, aren't you? Uh-huh. I used to be pretty wild when I was a young fellow. <laughs> on a motorcycle once. And... Yes, yes, I know, yes. Well, let's drink up. Find me a victim, will you, Gerald? Huh? Well, you know, according to the legend, I've got to murder someone... 
Uh, maybe even you. <laughs> Harvey the murderer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh. mm, very nice wine. How about another? Right. Well, here's to uh, your lovely wife. And um, how about switching glasses? Huh? Well, you might as well get a kick out of it, too. Um, well, uh, <laughs> okay. Here goes. I watched the fool swagger as he drank down the wine. In an hour, when he was alone, he'd be shivering with fright at what he'd done. <laughs> well, I did it. You certainly did. By the way, Gerald... Yes? I checked Arthur's story about this goblet. Yeah? And it seems that he's right. Everyone who ever put his lips to this goblet has committed a murder. You mean... Well, of course, it's all coincidence, but... Uh, then again, who knows? All the next week, I kept reminding Gerald about his drinking from the goblet. I wasn't really trying to get him to kill, but it was amusing to see him get upset and uneasy. And I noticed he was getting a little bolder, particularly with Susan, and had developed a temper. And one night, just as I was about to retire... Hello, is that you, Harvey? Yes, Susan, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, I'm just a little worried about Gerald. He oh. usually gets home at about six, and it's eleven o'clock now. Do you know where he might be? Why, he's having dinner with his sister. His sister? Yes, a tall, dark girl. She was in the office today and... The... Harvey, Gerald has no sisters. Oh, he hasn't? No. Oh, uh, I, um... Uh, I guess I got him mixed up with someone else. Yes, yes, it, it was Les Gordon who was meeting his sister. Yes, Gerald had some business to take care of over in Milford. You're and not that... very good at covering up, Harvey. I'm coming right over. Please wait up for me. <laughs> Things were beginning to happen. It was becoming very interesting. Now we'd see. Harvey, I want you to tell me everything. I must know. Who is this girl? Take it easy, Susie. Come, sit down, sit down. Oh, never mind that. What about Gerald? I don't know anything about Gerald's private life. And besides, you're not the one to talk. What on earth do you mean? You know perfectly well what I mean. You don't really care for Gerald. Actually, you're in love with me. Harvey. Well, you are, aren't you? Maybe. Sometimes I think I am. <laughs> oh, but you're too cold-blooded. I'd never be sure I could trust you. As a matter of fact, you'd like to get rid of Gerald. Why, why do you say that? Well, I'm just putting your thoughts into words. You never really loved him, did you? Oh, but Harvey... And he's finally become unbearable. Hasn't he? Oh, Harvey, if you only knew. Do you know that the last time Gerald was here, he drank out of that goblet of Arthur's? It's possible that he wants to get rid of you, too. Oh, stop it! Stop it, you hear? Well, I'm just telling you what I think you ought to know. Oh, we'll see. I left word at home that Gerald was to meet me here. And if he does come, well, we'll see. He sat and waited, not talking much. Susan's face was pale and agitated. It was most exciting. Susan, with all her charm and embellishments, was really a fierce animal underneath. I could almost hear her rage seething. Are you expecting anyone? Just Gerald. Well, let him in. Oh, hello, Harvey. Susan, what's up? Why did you leave word to meet you here? It's almost midnight. Where have you been all the evening? At Milford. With whom? What's going on, anyway? What are you so excited about, Susan? What were you doing in Milford? Why, I went there on business. Oh, really? You've been behaving very strangely lately, Gerald. If you don't love me, why don't you say so like a man? What? This is all your fault, Harvey. You've been filling her head with poison. I? I had nothing to do with this. I told her that you went to Milford. All he did was to make me see clearly something I've felt for a long while. And I think this is the time to do something about it. Sue, are you out of your mind? Put that gun down. You remember it, don't you? You gave it to me. Said it might be useful in an emergency. Harvey, take that gun away from her. She's liable to shoot. She won't shoot. She's only trying to frighten you. Am I? Let's see. Oh, oh my shoulder. Give me that no. gun. Give me no. that <laughs> Harvey. She... She's dead. Yes, Gerald. 
And you killed her. But, but it was an accident. She shot at me, and I was only trying to get the gun away from her. You know that's what happened. I only know that you drank from that goblet and that you killed her. What? But... Oh, you... You dirty treacherous... You planned all this so that you could get rid of me. So that you could have Susan. You could have the firm for yourself. You'll have to do better than that to beat the gallows, Gerald. The gallows? Please, Harvey. We've been friends for a long time. You can't let me down. You wouldn't have pressed the trigger if you hadn't had murder in your heart, Gerald. You shot her because you wanted to. That's what I saw. I believe in telling the truth. Harvey, I'll turn over the business to you. I'll do anything, anything, if you'll just... I don't accept bribes, Gerald. All right. But I'll fool you. I'll call the police myself. Well, there's the phone. I'll prove my case in court. They won't convict me. Operator. Operator. Give me the police. Hello? Police department? This is Gerald Hamilton. I, I just accidentally shot my wife. And my friend's home. Yes, she's dead. The address is 411 Grove Street. That's right. I killed her. Accidentally. Yes. I'll be waiting here. Cigarette, Gerald? Oh, treating me like a condemned man, huh? No, I'm not going to die. All I have to do is tell the truth about everything, including you. Oh, but you forget, Gerald. There must be fingerprints, your fingerprints on that gun. That won't look very accidental, will it? I... But, but Harvey... You I... did it, Gerald. I saw you. If you don't back me up, they'll hang me like a common criminal. Please, Harvey, don't let them do that to me, please. Oh, stop whining, Gerald. What? All right, Harvey, I'll stop. You're responsible for this whole thing. You know you are. And since they can only hang me once... He raised the gun, but I'd been expecting it. I grabbed his hand, pushed it against his chest. My finger pressed on his and on the trigger. And suddenly, he went limp. You won't get away. My alibi was perfect. All I had to do was wait for the police that he himself had called. The minutes ticked slowly away... And then... Hello, Harvey. Arthur. Glad I found you in. Say, you look as if you'd been in a fight. Arthur, you'd, uh, you'd better not come in. Why? What's the matter? No, no, you, you'd better not come in. Oh, but why? Well, uh, uh, Gerald and uh, Susan, they, they had a quarrel and he killed her. What? And then he shot himself. What are you talking about, Harvey? Well, all right, come in. Look for yourself. Good. Good Lord. Yeah, tried to kill me, too. But, but why? It doesn't sound like him or like either of them. Well, I don't know why. Fit of insanity? Or maybe it was the, the goblet. Your goblet. He drank out of it, you know. The goblet? Why, that's ridiculous. As he spoke, he picked up the gun. It made me furious. All those fine fingerprints of Gerald's were now erased. Put that gun down, Arthur. There are fingerprints on it. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. I tried to get hold of myself. The stupid fool, he was going to ruin everything. But I had to keep calm. What, uh... What were you saying about the goblet? Why, it has no curse or magic. I just made that story up. You... You... You made it... You mean... Of course, I bought the goblet in an antique shop. As a matter of fact, I have a whole set of them. The pulses hammered away in my head. A vast, uncontrollable anger seized me. Was it because of those precious fingerprints that he'd wiped out? Or because I had believed in the goblet myself? I don't know. I only know that I had to fight to keep from grabbing him by the throat. You know... I don't think you're telling me everything you know about this horrible business, Harvey. In fact... A red-hot wave came over me. I don't remember exactly what happened. Let me go! Get your hands off me! Oh. Arthur's body is lying there, too, now. Next to Susan's and Gerald's. But the police will be here any minute, so I have to hurry. First, the goblet. There. That's done. That... No. Some of the broken fragments still glitter in the lamplight. I've got to crush them. Grind them to powder under my heel. But... But there are always other pieces that I can't find. There. 
They're hiding from me. They're afraid of me. But I'll find every piece. I'll find them. I'll find them. I'll find them. <laughs> bodies lying huddled on the floor, and the madman crushing the fragments of the broken goblet to powder as the police car drives up and the clock strikes twelve for murder at midnight. us again when death appears at the door, wearing the face of a friend, and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Harvey was played by Eric Dressler. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. a body without leaving any traces. Exactly, Sergeant. You'd better take a sample of it. Very well, Inspector. There's a jar on the shelf here. I'll use that. Today, that jar containing the acid sample can be seen in the Black Museum. <laughs> the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. And here we are in the Black 
Art Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Here lies death, unseen but ever present, uncatalogued but orderly, enveloping the shadows, papering the walls, carpeting the floor, death, for display purposes only. And here's a hypodermic syringe. It was once used to inject life-preserving serums and later used to inject poison. And there is an umbrella, ordinary everyday umbrella, ordinary and everyday up to a point, that is. Look closer and you'll see just how sharp that point is, just how lethal a sword stick can be as a weapon of murder. Ah, here we are, here's the acid jar, sealed and somber looking in its place on the shelf. Once this jar rested on another shelf, a workshop shelf in Crawley, uh, but let's not anticipate. Let's begin our story at its beginning. Not on the shelf of a workshop in Crawley, but in the dining room of a hotel in Kensington. Dinner time. One corner of the room at a table set for two sits an attractive, fashionably dressed woman. She's joined by another equally as attractive and equally fashionably dressed. Agnes, how are you? I'd almost given you up to last. Sorry if I kept you waiting, my dear. But just as I was leaving my room, I ran into Mr. Hart. He's such a lovely man. I simply couldn't resist stopping to have a few words with him. Mr. Hart? The nice-looking one I pointed out to at lunchtime. Oh, yes, of course. He really is the sweetest thing. And so friendly. I thought he looked rather intriguing. He must introduce us. I will, my dear. And sooner than you think. I've asked him to join us when he comes down. You don't mind, I hope. Oh, the contrary. I'm so glad. I know you'll like him. Isn't that him coming in now? So it is. Over here, Mr. Hart. Ah. Oh, forgive me for keeping you so long, Mrs. Regan. I had a little bother with my necktie. Oh, please don't apologize. I only just arrived this minute myself. Oh, I'd like you to meet a very dear friend of mine, Mrs. Lansbury. Agnes, Mr. Hart. How do you do, Mr. Hart? Delighted, Mrs. Lansbury. I do hope I'm not intruding. Oh, a perfectly horrible thought. Of course you're not, Mr. Hart. Do sit down. <laughs> you're very kind. What a thorough gentleman he was. And so amusing. So very, very amusing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. Hart, I do declare. It's a long time since I've laughed so much or enjoyed a meal so much. <laughs> oh, save the latter compliment for the hotel cook, Mrs. Regan. <laughs> 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 and now I really must ask oh. that you excuse me. So too? You won't take coffee with us? Oh, much as I'd like to, Mrs. Regan, I'm afraid not. Oh. I have some rather pressing business to attend to this evening. Business that won't wait, uh, even for coffee. Uh, some other time, perhaps. Oh, we'll hold you to that, you know. <laughs> oh, please do, Mrs. Lansbury. Please do. The two ladies, who were both widows, chatted on till late that evening, discussing the numerous virtues and charms of their newfound acquaintance. A topic that was continued the following morning at breakfast and then again at lunch. Will he be dining with us this evening? I'll ask him when he comes in. Oh, don't forget. As if I could, my dear. The annual Mr. Hart proved only too ready to accept a second dinner invitation and a third. He appeared to enjoy the two ladies' company as much as they did his. But it was upon Mrs. Regan that he centered most of his attention. I thought of taking a stroll in the country this afternoon, Mrs. Regan. You wouldn't care to join me, I suppose. Why, I'd love to, Mr. Hart. I simply adore the country. Fine. We'll start out straight after lunch. The country stroll agreed with Mrs. Regan, as proved by the healthy flush in her cheeks that evening as she sat down to dinner with Mrs. Lansbury. You're looking very radiant tonight, my dear. Oh, am I? <sighs> Your afternoon jaunt with Mr. Hart appears to have brought about a most desirable effect. It was rather refreshing. He's, uh, not coming down this evening? He has another business engage engagement. Oh. <laughs> what exactly is his business, my dear? Well, I'm not sure. He never really discussed it with me. Hmm, did he? Oh, by the way, I'm off to town to do some shopping tomorrow afternoon. I thought we might go together. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. But I'm afraid I've made other arrangements. Oh? Yes. I promised to meet Mr. Hart... We're going to Crawley for the afternoon. Oh, how nice for you. You do mind? Oh, no, of course not. We can leave our trip to town to next week sometime. It makes no difference to me. No, it made no difference to Agnes Lansbury. 
But to Rene Ashcroft Regan, it made a great deal of difference. The difference between life and death. <laughs> Mrs. Regan did not appear for dinner the next evening, or did Mr. Hart. Nothing particularly unusual about that. Obviously, they decided to stay in Crawley for dinner. Mrs. Lansbury dined alone at the hotel. The following morning, arriving down late for breakfast, she was surprised to find that there was still no sign of her friend. Honey, what often to Mrs. Breakfast? Oh, good morning, Mrs. Lansbury. Oh, oh Mr. Hart, good morning. Uh, Mrs. Regan, not down yet? Oh, no, not yet. <laughs> not like her to be late. Well, she probably slept in. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, have you had breakfast? Uh, yes, I came in earlier. Just on my way out. Mm-hmm. Business again? That's right. Well, I must be off. No doubt I'll see you at dinner. Yes, don't be late. I won't. Uh, till this evening, then. Yes. It was almost nine o'clock when Mrs. Lansbury finally left the breakfast table, and still no sign of Mrs. Regan. Strange Mr. Hart had not mentioned their visit to Crawley the previous afternoon. But perhaps the dear man preferred to keep it a secret. One never knew what sort of gossip could spread itself about a hotel, even a spark of encouragement. Still... Still, it did seem rather odd. It seemed even more odd when Mrs. Regan did not appear for lunch. A feeling of uneasiness crept over Mrs. Lansbury. Perhaps her friend was ill. She would make some inquiries. Oh, boy. Yes, ma'am? Uh, have you seen Mrs. Regan about it all this morning? Mrs. Regan? No, madam. Not that I can remember. Well, uh, perhaps you'd better take me to her room. Very good, madam. This way. The bellhop looked pretty in his blue uniform with a red braid and brass buttons. Such a fresh young face. So unspoiled looking and clean. With a quick, toothy smile. Not as engaging a smile as Mr. Hart, perhaps, but nevertheless quite attractive in its way. Here we are, madam. Oh, thank you. Uh, oh, here. Yeah. Thank you, madam. Anything else you might be wanting? Well, uh, well, I'm not sure yet. Just a moment. Must have slipped out for a bit. Well, I'll try the door. Knock. Rene? Rene? Are you in there? Nothing wrong, is there, madam? Oh, I don't know. I think Mrs. Regan may be ill. you better go and call the manager. Uh, tell him to bring a pass key. Very good, madam. I'll be a gift. The hotel manager arrived in due course, asked a few rather pointless questions, fiddled with his large key ring, and finally opened the door to Mrs. Regan's room. It was empty. It looks as though your flowers were groundless, Mrs. Lansbury. Uh, she must have gone into town for the day. But that still doesn't explain why she didn't come down to breakfast this morning. Oh, perhaps she didn't feel like it. Still, I'll have a word with the roommaid. She may have noticed something when she came in to tidy up. The roommate was duly summoned and questioned. No, Mrs. Regan had not been in her room when she came in to clean up. Yes, yes, she'd noticed something unusual, something most unusual, as a matter of fact. Mrs. Regan's bed had not been slept in on the previous night. That settled it. Something's happened to her. I can feel it. She's met with some kind of accident and... Hey, calm yourself, Mrs. Lansbury. I'm sure that... Well, how can I calm myself when my closest friend has disappeared into thin air? But, my dear... The police uh... must be informed at once. Oh, oh, come now, Mrs. Lansbury. Let's not be too hasty. Please please don't argue with me, Mr. Stewart. I want them contacted immediately. Very well, if you insist. Uh, But I would ask you to refrain from mentioning the matter to any of the other guests. At least until we have something definite. At the hotel manager's request, Mrs. Lansbury agreed to keep silent. But being a woman, she could not keep entirely silent. She had to confide in someone. Naturally enough, the someone she confided in was the benign Mr. James Gerald Hart. His concern was touching. Dear me, this is most upsetting, Mrs. Lansbury. When was the last time you saw Mrs. Regan? Just after lunch yesterday. She was on her way out. Hmm. Uh, Did she by any chance uh, say where she was going? Well, Mr. Hart, as a matter of fact, uh, yes, she did. Oh? Yes, she said she was going to meet you in town, that you were going down to Crawley together. Did she meet you, Mr. Hart? Well, uh, no, she didn't. Uh, That's just what I was about to tell you. I'd arranged to meet her outside the Army and Navy stores in Victoria Street at 2 o'clock. I was there on time, and I waited over an hour, but she didn't show up. Oh. Have the police been contacted? Well, yes. The hotel manager, Mr. Stewart, gave him a ring shortly after lunch. They haven't been here? Well, not that I know of. Hmm. You know, I I rather think it might be an idea if we went round to the station and had a word with them ourselves. 
we may be able to, to give them some lead or other. What do you think? Oh, I think it's an excellent idea, Mr. Hart. As a matter of fact, I, I was hoping you'd suggest it. Good. We can go straight away. I'll get my hat and coat and join you in the lobby in ten minutes. And so it was that the disappearance of Mrs. Rene Ashcroft Regan was confirmed. Mr. Hart repeated his story of the proposed Crawley visit to the police. And that story was accepted. At that time, there was no reason at all why it should not have been. <laughs> Well, today evidence to the contrary can be seen in the Black Museum. At least a dozen women are reported to the police as missing every week. Rene Ashcroft Regan was only one more female whose name and description had to be distributed to every station in the Metropolitan Police Forces area and printed in the current editions of the Police Gazette. Routine, nothing more. Steady, patient routine. At the Chelsea station, woman police sergeant Carol Henderson, whose duty it was to check through the daily records of missing persons in the area, came up on the case of Mrs. Regan and, as a routine step, paid a visit to the Kensington Hotel for a brief chat with those who had known her there. Naturally enough, the first name on her list was that of Mrs. Agnes Lansbury. Now, Mrs. Lansbury, if you could just tell me when you last saw Mrs. Regan, what she was wearing, and, and as much as you can remember of any conversation that may have passed between you on the day of her disappearance. Mrs. Lansbury could add nothing to what she had already told the police, but nevertheless was most helpful and directed Sergeant Henderson to the room of the much-concerned but still charming Mr. James Gerald Hart. Do sit down, Sergeant. Thank you, Mr. Hart, but I prefer to stand when I'm on duty. Oh, it's not often one has the pleasure of meeting a lady policeman. Huh. But as you wish, if she doesn't mind, I would... Oh, not at all. Now, uh, I understand, Mr. Hart, from what Mrs. Lansbury tells me, that you've arranged to meet Mrs. Regan on the day of her disappearance. Hmm? That's correct. I was to meet her at two o'clock outside the Army and Navy stalls in Victoria but Street. But she didn't show up? No. How long did you wait for her, Mr. Hart? Oh, at least an hour. Close to an hour and a half, I should imagine. And then? Well, as you may know, we intended going to Crawley together. Well, when I realized she wasn't coming, I drove down alone. Oh, I see. Exactly what had you intended going to Crawley for, Mr. Hart? Well, as a matter of fact, I have an interest in the chemical factory down there. I'm what you might call a research chemist. Oh, yes? Mrs. Regan was hoping to purchase some samples of certain plastic fingernails I'm manufacturing. I see. Well, I think that's all I need from you at the present, Mr. Hart. Thank you for your time and your cooperation. No trouble at all, Sergeant. I'm most anxious to have this matter cleared up, you understand. Mrs. Regan and I were close friends, and I hate to think that anything may have happened to her. Quite. If I can help you in any way, I'd only be too pleased. That's very kind of you, Mr. Hart, but I think we'll be able to manage. If we need any further information from you, you, you can rest assured we'll get in touch with you. Sergeant Henderson returned to the Chelsea police station. She had listened to what had seemed a straightforward story, but there was... A doubt nagging at her. Hart's manner had been very obliging and polite, but there had been something about him she didn't like, something that didn't ring true. That something took her to the office of Divisional Inspector Russell White, to whom she expressed her doubts. So you think it's a bit fishy, eh, Sergeant? Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, sir, but, well, I, I do think Hart might bear checking up on. Well, that's good enough for me. Scotland Yard, please. Criminal Records Office. Within the hour, the checkup had been made and the results phoned back to Chelsea. The results that stood by Sergeant Henderson's feminine intuition. According to the records, the plausible Mr. Hart had served two sentences for fraud. Well, there you have it, Sergeant. It appears he's been up twice in the past ten years. I can't say it surprises me. Perhaps not, but I wouldn't let it influence you too much. Just because a man has a record, it doesn't say he knows anything about Mrs. Regan's disappearance. That's true. I think at this stage, the best thing we can do is to forget about Hart for a while and concentrate on Mrs. Regan herself. Give the newspapers a full description of her and the clothes she was last seen wearing. The usual thing. All right, I'll get onto it straight away. Thus did the story of Mrs. Rene Ashcroft Regan's disappearance receive its first coverage in the London newspapers. A close-up photograph and underneath it, a full description of the missing woman as she was last seen by Mrs. Lansbury 
prior to her leaving the hotel for her proposed meeting with James Hart. Mm-hmm. Well, that should bring results, Sergeant. Let's hope so, Inspector. The jewelry is the thing. Mrs. Lansbury is quite sure she was wearing it when she left the hotel. Oh, she was most emphatic about it. Good. Every jeweler and hock store proprietor in London has been alerted. If a legitimate sale is attempted, we'll hear of it. Two days passed. No information was received by the police. Then on the third day, word came through that a Persian lamb coat very similar to the one worn by Mrs. Regan at the time of the disappearance had been found in a cleaner shop near Crawley. It was later identified by Agnes Lansbury and then brought to the Chelsea police station for analysis. Laboratory tests, however, failed to uncover any further leads. Nothing more, Inspector? I'm afraid not. But it went through the wash before it was noticed. Yes, Still, I suppose we shouldn't complain. At least we know now, without a shadow of doubt, that something has happened to Mrs. Regan. Oh, and also that it happened somewhere in the vicinity of Crawley, which is where she was supposed to have been going with her. A further two days passed. Then came the information that Inspector White had been waiting for. A report was received that jewellery, fitting the description issued by the police and newspapers, had been offered for sale to the proprietor of the second-hand store in Horsham. It was also identified by Mrs. Lansbury as belonging to the missing Mrs. Regan. Proprietor, Sally Jacobs, was questioned by Inspector White. Just how long have you been holding this jewelry, Mr. Jacobs? One week tomorrow. Party brought it in just after lunch. Hmm, well, that fits. And this party gave his name as Jones, you say? Well, here's the ticket. John Jones. You couldn't give us a description of him, I don't suppose? Well, so let me be remembering like he was, um, uh, short, stocky, with a dark hair and, uh, well, I'm not quite sure, but I think he had a small moustache. A small moustache. Anything else? Well, not that I can bring to mind, no. Yes. Well, it just so happens, Mr. Jacobs, I have a few photographs in my pocket of men who could fit the description you've given me. I wonder if you'll take a look at them. Well, what have I to lose? What about this one? Ah, uh, no. This? Ah, no, there's nothing like it. Well, how about this one? Oh. Well... Why, that's him. You're sure of that? As sure as I'm standing here. I never forget a fight. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. You've been very helpful. Returning to the Chelsea police station, Inspector White summoned Sergeant Henderson to his office. Bringing her up to date on his visit to Horsham, he produced the photograph that had been recognized by Jacobs. James Gerald Hart. As he was when arrested in 1939 for fraud. <laughs> Hasn't changed much. Fortunately for us. Going to pull him in? All in good time. If he's done away with Mrs. Regan, as facts seem to indicate, he must have deposited her body somewhere. His chemical factory. Well, that's as good a place to start looking as any. Tell Peters and Cunningham to stand by. We'll pick up Hart on the way down. Twenty minutes later, Inspector White, accompanied by Sergeant Henderson, arrived at the Kensington Hotel and asked for Mr. Hart. That smiling gentleman... As smooth and suave as ever, came downstairs immediately, greeting the sergeant with an airy wave of his hand. Good afternoon, sergeant. I was hoping you'd call again. Oh? Yes, yes. I've been rather anxious to hear what progress has been made in the search for Mrs. Rickon. Perhaps you better ask Inspector White here that question. He's taken over the handling of the case. Oh? How do you do, Inspector? Mr. Hart? Before I answer your questions, Mr. Hart, I have a few I'd like you to answer for me. By all means, by the way. Sergeant Henderson tells me that you have an interest in a certain chemical factory at Crawley. That's correct. And that you arranged to take Mrs. Regan there on the afternoon of her disappearance. Yes. We'd rather like to look over this factory if it can be managed. It's just routine, you understand? Of course. Any time, Inspector. Will tomorrow morning suit you? Hardly, Mr. Hart. It'll have to be this afternoon. Well, I, I'm not sure that... That would be convenient, Inspector. You see, I, I have a business appointment in Chelsea at three, then, and then... I'm afraid your business appointment will have to wait, Mr. Harley. But it's... Let's be on our way, shall we? I have a car waiting outside. For a fleeting second, the ever-present smile almost faded from the lips of James Hart. Then it broadened, and his perfect white teeth flashed in the sunlight, streaming through a lobby window. Lead on, Inspector. Little was said during the trip down to Crawley. In the back seat of the police car on either side of Hart, Inspector White and Sergeant Henderson interested themselves in the swiftly passing countryside, and in the front, Constable Rex Peters sat grimly at the wheel, and beside him, equally as grim-faced, sat Sergeant Dennis Cunningham. 
The silence appeared to amuse Mr. Hart, who chuckled audibly to himself more than once, before remarking casually, Lovely spot, Crawley, don't you agree, Inspector? Huh? Oh, yes, yes, indeed. I've often thought how very pleasant it would be to live down here. Oh, next turning to the right, Constable. A few minutes later, the police car came to a standstill outside the Hart Chemical Factory, which proved to be a little more than a glorified workshop fitted up as a laboratory. Hart remained in the car under the watchful eyes of Peters and Cunningham while the inspector and Sergeant Henderson entered the wooden building. Well, plenty of experimental equipment lying about. Nothing else. Much else, as far as I can see. No. Certainly no corpus delecti. <clears throat> Hold on. What's in those drums over there? Oh. Looks like some kind of oil. Yes. Oil be hanged. It's acid. Drums of acid in a laboratory. Nothing very odd about that unless... Unless that acid happens to contain the undissolved remains of the human body. Acid. Just the thing to decompose a corpse without leaving any trace. Exactly, Sergeant. But in this case, I think it may have left traces. Look, floating on the surface. Looks like a piece of bone. With particles of flesh still clinging to it. You'd better take a sample of the acid itself. Siphon it out. Very well, Inspector. There's a jar on the shelf here. I'll I'll use that. James Gerald Hart made no attempt to deny the accusation of murder that was subsequently leveled at him. On the contrary, knowing the game was up, he admitted his guilt freely, stating that he had first shot Mrs. Regan and deprived her of her clothing and jewelry, then deposited her body in the drum of acid, a sample of which today occupies this position of honor in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. The defense, brilliantly conceived, was, of course, insanity. To strengthen this plea, Hart cheerfully claimed to have done away with no fewer than nine other victims in a similar fashion to that in which he had disposed of Mrs. Regan. Whether or not this claim was justified will probably never be known. But it is an established fact that at the time of his trial... Five of those he named as his victims had been missing from their homes for months. They have not been found to this day. However, justified or not, his plea was rejected and he was found guilty of murder in the first degree. His subsequent execution relieved the world of a murder student who set up in practice before taking his diploma. For James Gerald Hart was by no means an accomplished killer. The trail he left behind him bears out that fact. Rather could he be described as a dabbler in the art of dealing death, who dabbled just once too often. And now, until we meet next time in the same place, I tell you another story about the Black Museum. I remain, as always, obediently yours. The Lord of the Elements wants to change reality. He's enlisted the evil Zeltan to help him, and together they'll try to recruit Stanley, a man gifted with incredible imaginative capabilities to help them. Unless Edward and his friends can stop them, that is. A tale of white and black magic, quantum physics, and a plot that twists and turns. If you like science fiction, fantasy, and horror, you'll love The Last Observer, A Magic Battle for Reality by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample of The Last Observer on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com.
The Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join him on another journey into the realm of the strange and terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves. Where are we going? We're going to journey to the grave and learn the secrets of the dead in a tale titled... The Accusing Corpse. Some years ago, when I was a county coroner, I was called in on a most interesting case. A case which had begun in the country home of Philip Drake, the wealthy stockbroker. Roger, thank goodness you were able to get here in time. I left town right after I received your call. What's wrong, Philip? You sounded so upset over the phone. It's Vivian. She's upstairs in her room packing. She says she's leaving me. Leaving you? Why? She seems to feel our marriage has been a mistake. Roger, won't you speak to her? Persuade her to stay. After all, she is your sister. I'm afraid, Philip, that Vivian and I have never been as close as sister and brother should be. She's always been wild and spoiled. Perhaps, Philip, it would be better if... If you were to let her go. No, I couldn't do that. I love her, Roger. I wouldn't want to live without her. Won't you please try to persuade her to stay? All right, Philip. I'll do my best. But I must warn you, I haven't much influence well, over her. I'm all packed and ready to... Why, Roger, darling, what a surprise. What are you doing here? Vivian, Philip has told me. Now, surely you can't be serious... You know how he loves you, everything he's done to make you happy. Now, now, Roger, you aren't going to start on that, are you? Someday, Vivian, you'll get just what you deserve for walking over people, breaking their hearts. Every time I think of you being my sister, I feel... Roger, like... please. Would you mind waiting in the other room? I'd like to speak to Vivian alone. Oh, all right, Philip. Call me when you want me. Really, Philip, no matter what you have to say, you're just wasting your time. Oh, Vivian, how can you do this to me? You know I love you, but I'd do anything to make you happy. That's sweet of you, dear. Would you mind lending me your car to get to town? If you leave me, Vivian, you won't get a cent. Not a cent, do you hear? Really? Did you ever stop to think, Philip, that there might be another man huh? with more money than you? Another man? Oh, no, there couldn't be. And why not? But we've only been married three months. There, there couldn't be anyone in that time. Oh, but there was. Oh, Vivian, oh, in spite of what you've done... I'm willing to forgive you and start over with you. <laughs> but, darling, I don't want you to forgive me. I want you to forget me. Vivian, you can't do this to me. I love you. I won't let you go. I really must be saying goodbye now. He's waiting for me in town, and I don't want to be late. If I can't have you, no one else will, do you hear? Oh, really, Philip, you're being ridiculous. I must go. No. Philip, what are you doing? A gun. Yes, Vivian, a gun. I told you if I couldn't have you, no one else would. Oh, Philip, you're insane. Put that gun down. If you don't change your mind about leaving, I'll kill you. Even with that gun, you can't keep me, do you hear? I'd sooner die than go on living with you. I'm going. And you're not going to stop. <laughs> oh, you... You shot... Vivian. Philip. Philip, Philip, what happened? I, I thought I heard... Vivian. Roger. Is she... Dead? Yes. Philip, do you, do you know what this may mean? Life imprisonment, perhaps. E even the electric chair. I know. Nothing seems to matter now. But, but you simply can't throw your life away like that, Philip. Oh, even if Vivian was my sister, I don't mind telling you that I always felt you were far too good for her. She didn't deserve to be your wife. Oh, please, Roger. Now, look, Philip. If, if we were to get rid of the body... Who could possibly know that she didn't leave here tonight as she'd planned? Oh, no. oh, it wouldn't work, Roger. You can't get away with murder. That's nonsense, Philip. Now, now, if we were to bury her in the woods, no one would ever find the body. Bury her in the woods? I couldn't do that. Well, then I'll do it. You can wait here till I return. But, Roger, what if, Philip, you must let me handle this. You, you'd better give me the gun. All right, Roger. Here you are. Good. Now, now, you wait here while I get rid of the body.
Philip watched, spellbound, unable to say a word, as Roger picked up the body and left the room. As Roger, carrying his burden past the gardener's shed, he picked up a shovel. In a few moments, he reached the woods which began at the rear of the house and extended for miles. He carefully made his way through the forest underbrush until he was well out of sight of the house. Then he stopped and looked about. Uh, I, I think this is quite far enough. I think you can put me down now, Roger. I'm tired of being carried like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> well, let me congratulate you on your performance as a corpse. <laughs> Do you think he suspects anything? <laughs> of course he doesn't. He's positive that he shot and killed you. You've got the gun, haven't you? Well, certainly I've got it. You don't think I was going to let him discover that the bullets had been removed and blank cartridges substituted, do you? Oh, no. Not you, Roger. You always know what you're doing. I always try to, my dear sister. You don't think Philip will give you any trouble, do you? Outside of being in love with me, he isn't an utter fool. <laughs> don't worry. I can handle Philip. Now, uh, here's the key to the apartment I rented in town. You'll find my car a quarter of a mile down the road. All right. I'll be waiting for you at the apartment. I'll be there in a few hours. Oh, no. Now, let me see. Yes. Yes, this seems like a nice place to dig. The next morning, Roger called on Philip at his office. With a calculating glance, he noted that Philip's eyes were bloodshot, that his hand trembled as the two shook hands. How are you, Philip? I couldn't sleep at all last night. I kept thinking of Vivian. And what if her disappearance is noticed? People begin asking questions. Now, all you have to do is tell them that Vivian left you and, and you don't know where she is. Or oh, things like that happen every day. You've been very helpful to me, Roger. And if ever I get a chance to repay you for it, rest assured, I will. That's very good of you, Philip. Uh, truth of the matter is, you, uh, you could do me a favor if you would. Of course. What is it? Well... I'm in the midst of a business deal, and I find myself a little short of capital. If you could lend me some money, I'd appreciate it. Oh, certainly, Roger. How much do you need? Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand? That's quite a lot. Naturally, Philip, if you feel you can't lend it to me, I'll go to a bank and try to borrow it. Oh, it isn't that I can't lend it to you, Roger. It's just that the amount surprised me. Uh, shall I make the check out to you? Uh, y yes, if you please. All right. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this, Philip. As Philip wrote out a check for $20,000, Roger smiled. Things were working out just as he had planned. An hour later, Roger entered an old brownstone house and went to apartment 2C. Roger, did you get it? <laughs> what does this look like? Oh, Roger, that's wonderful. Now we can clear out and... Why, there isn't a hundred thousand here. <laughs> no, my dear. I only got twenty thousand from him. But we were after a hundred thousand. Why didn't you get it all this morning when you saw him? My dear Vivian, it simply isn't done that way. Uh, blackmail is an art. An art that calls for the use of psychology. Philip will give us many times over the money I hold in my hand. All in due time, of course. You mean I'll have to go on hiding in this miserable apartment until you finish your little game with him? Never being able to leave it for fear someone will recognize it. Come, come now, Vivian. You've got the radio and books I and won't other... spend weeks in this apartment, I tell you. I won't. My arm. You'll do exactly as I say, Vivian. Exactly. Do you understand? Roger, my arm. You're hurting it's me. It's nothing to what I'll do if you disobey me. Do I make myself clear? Yes, yes. A week passed. A week in which Roger patiently bided his time. For time, he knew, was working on his side against Philip. Then one morning, he called on Philip at his office. Good morning, Philip. How are you? How do you expect me to be? This past week, I've been able to think of nothing but Vivian and what happened that night. Philip, you must stop brooding over it. Whatever happened was her fault, not yours. Yes, you're right. Perhaps what I need is a vacation. Yes, yes, of course. A trip would do you a world of good. And if I could afford it, I'd go along with you. You mean 
You haven't any money? I'm, I'm afraid not, Philip. That's what I've come to see you about. I must have $40,000 at once. 40000 Yes, I, I know it's a good deal of money, Philip, but without it, I'll be ruined. Well, naturally, I want to help you, Roger, but 40000 If I don't get the 40000 Philip, it may mean prison for me. Now, you wouldn't want to see that happen, would you? Well, of course not, Roger, well, but... After all, Philip, I, I saved you from prison. In fact, I made myself an accomplice to Vivian's murder by not turning you over to the police. Well, yes, I know, now, but... you you could hardly expect me to remain loyal to you if you weren't willing to help me, could you? I see. It seems I haven't any choice. Very well, Roger. I'll write you out a check. Roger's eyes gleamed in amusement as he accepted the check from Philip. There was no longer any doubt that Philip understood him perfectly. Things were working out exactly as he had planned. Later that day, Roger went back to the old brownstone house. There was a smile on his lips as he entered apartment 2C. <laughs> Look at this. $40,000 in cash. Oh, Roger. Now, wasn't this worth staying and hiding for, Vivian? And there's plenty more where this came from. Who could that be? You better get behind that screen. Oh. All right, Roger. Uh, yes? C.O.D. for Miss Brown. It amounts to $64. Oh, uh, you must be mistaken. There's no Miss Brown here. This is the address she gave. It's in care of Mr. Roger Martinson. Is that your name? Why, why yes, but I don't have uh, any... Those packages are for me, Roger. Uh, how much did you say the C.O.D. was? $64, Miss. Oh. Here you are. Thank you, Miss. Here's your receipt. Goodbye. Goodbye. When did you buy those clothes? This morning. You mean you went out shopping in spite of what I told you? Well, I was sick of being cooped up in this apartment day and night. I had to do something for a change. And what of my plans? You risk everything with so much at stake. Roger, stop looking at me like that. I tell you, I couldn't stand being cooped up in this apartment any longer. But I give you orders to stay here. Well, I won't. I want you to get the rest of the money at once so we can clear out. And if you don't, I'll go shopping whenever I feel like it. You can't make me stay here. <gasps> You'll do exactly as I say, Vivian. I won't allow anything or anyone to interfere with my plans. I've worked out every step perfectly, and there isn't going to be any slip-up. Another week passed, a week in which Roger made no effort to see Philip. Then early one evening, he got into his car and drove out of the city to Philip's home in the country. Oh, it's you, Roger. Come in. Good evening, Philip. Oh, uh, where are the servants? This is their night off. Oh. Uh, you're uh, you're not looking well at all, Philip. You, you shouldn't remain in this house by yourself. What difference does it make where I am? Wherever I go, the memory of that night follows... Hard to believe that it was only two weeks ago tonight that I killed her. Two weeks ago tonight? Well, so it was. Oh, well, uh, oh, by the way, Philip, do you think you might possibly lend me $60,000? 60000 huh? $60, You can't be serious. Oh, but I am. But I lent you that much already. Yes, I know, but I must have more. No. I won't give you another cent. You've blackmailed me enough. Blackmail is a harsh word. Philip. What else can you call it? Now, you're just as hard and grasping as Vivian was. Yes, but you must remember I'm alive and she isn't. I suppose you're glad she's dead. In life, she was worth nothing to you. In death, you're able to get $60,000 for her. In death? How do I know she is dead? But don't be foolish, Philip. You saw her lying on the floor in this very room. Yes, but how do I know she's dead? It was you who examined her and told me so. And you buried the body by yourself. Well, I, I just wanted to spare you, Philip. Just exactly where did you bury Vivian? As a matter of fact, how do I know the whole affair isn't staged for my special benefit? So that you can extort money from me. Now, surely you don't believe that, Philip. Why, you shot her with your own gun. Yes. And you took the gun away from me immediately after the shooting. 
Suddenly, that whole affair is becoming very clear to I me. I tell you, she's dead, Philip, and buried out in the woods. Then I want to see the grave and the body you say is in it. But this is ridiculous. I, I won't go searching for a grave in the middle of the night. You shouldn't have to search for it, Roger. Not if you really dug one. Come along. We can pick up a shovel at the tool shed. I won't do it. I won't do it. I, I said come it. along, Roger. Oh, very well. But I'm not certain I'll be able to find the grave. After all, the woods is fairly large, and it's been two weeks since I buried it. That's all right, Roger. We'll stay out there until you do find her. A few minutes later, Philip and Roger picked up the shovel at the tool shed and then continued on their way to the woods that began at the rear of the house. Neither of the men spoke as they entered the woods. Roger leading the way with a flashlight. Several times he stopped trying to get his bearings, then plunged on again, hoping to find a, a familiar landmark. It became apparent that Roger was growing less and less sure of himself. Oh, the grave is someplace around here. I'm certain of it. Perhaps we ought to come back in the daytime. It, it might be easier to find it then. I know, Roger. You shouldn't have any trouble finding it now. If it exists. It does exist, I tell you. It's it's just that the woods are so confusing at night. Everything looks so so different. Just keep on searching, Roger. Well, perhaps this is the spot. It it looks something like it. Well, is it or isn't I, it? I I don't know. It looks like the place where I buried her, and yet yet I'm I, I'm not certain. There's only one way to make certain, and that's to start digging. Here, here's the shovel. But suppose this isn't the spot. Then we'll dig somewhere else. In fact, we'll dig up the entire woods if necessary. After all, you're certain she is buried in the woods, aren't you? Go ahead, Roger. Start digging. Oh, oh, very well. Well, Roger, you've been digging for 20 minutes now, and you haven't uncovered a body. Philip, I told you I wasn't sure this was the spot. Well, You're a great actor, Roger. But I'm afraid this time you've overplayed your role. Uh, what do you mean? Vivian isn't dead. And there's no use your pretending she is. Everything that's happened was part of a scheme the two of you planned to extort money from me. I tell you she is dead. Then where's the body? I thought this was the spot that I must be mistaken at. I'm sure I didn't bury her any deeper than this, but if I... Philip, turn the flashlight this way. What is it? Look. Do you see what I've uncovered? <gasps> a hand? Yes. This is the spot where I buried her, Philip. Just a few more shovelfuls and I'll have her uncovered. Oh. Oh, it can't be. There. Ah, there you are, Philip. Of course, she's been in the ground for two weeks, but I think you can easily recognize that it's Vivian. Yes. It's... Vivian. And look, Philip, here's the bullet hole under her heart. The bullet hole that you made. I don't want to see any more. I've had enough. You should trust me a little more, Philip. Everything I did was for your own good. After all, you you don't want to go to the electric chair, do you? I don't care what happens anymore. I can't stand having her death on my conscience any longer. I'm going to call the police. Don't be a fool, Philip. You know it might well mean the electric chair. I'll take my chances. Anything's better than going on living the way I have these past two weeks. I'm going back to the house and call the police. Philip, Philip, come back. Come back. Philip! Operator. Operator. Philip, Philip, wait. Wait, don't do anything foolish. No, you cut me off. Take your hands off that phone, Roger. What I want you to do, Philip, is to listen to me for a few minutes. At the end of that time, you may you may do as you please. Now, that's fair enough, isn't it? Nothing you can say will make me change my mind about calling the now, police. listen to me first. Then if you still want to call the police, you can. Now, please put the receiver down, Philip. Yeah, that's it. Well, what do you want to tell me? Well, uh, do you mind if I mix myself a drink first? It's been a rather difficult evening. Very well. Oh, well, what about one for you, Philip? You look as though you could stand a drink. No, thank you. Oh, nonsense. Do you good. What is it you want to say to me, Roger? Huh? Oh, oh yes, say to you. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. 
Uh, here's your drink, Philip. Thank you. Well, now, uh, what shall we drink to? Uh, we'll drink to your good luck, come what may. Yeah, there. I feel a good deal better. All right. Now that we've had our drinks, what have you got to say? Oh, oh yes, yes, I, uh... What I wanted to say was I... I never let anything interfere with my plans, Philip. What do you mean by that? Simply that I can't allow you to go to the police, and therefore you shan't. It would spoil my plan. Oh, it would, would it? Well, I'd like to see you stop me. I have, Philip. In a very little while, in fact, in just a few seconds, you'll be dead. Dead? What are you saying? Yes, Philip. The drink I mixed for you was poisoned. Poisoned? Aren't you finding that it's becoming uh, difficult to breathe? Oh, no, you couldn't have. I... My throat it burns. Yes, I know, Philip, but it'll all be over in a matter of seconds. Now, I, I see it all. You, you might... Yes, Philip, just a week ago tonight, oh. she uh, died according to plan. I'm cool, please... I'm afraid, Philip, that you haven't the strength left to reach the telephone. I will. Uh-huh. I'm afraid you and Vivian never had a chance, Philip. I had things worked out perfectly, down to the smallest detail. Hello, operator. Uh, operator, please connect me with the police. It was at this point that I was called into the case. Inspector Carlton called me an hour after Roger Martinson had phoned the police. When I arrived at the Drake mansion, I examined the body of Vivian Drake and that of her husband, Philip. When I had finished my examination, I entered the library where Inspector Carlton was questioning Roger Martinson. Hello, Doc. Oh, Doc, this is Roger Martinson. Mr. Martinson, this is Dr. Smith, the county coroner. How do you do? Hello. I'll be with you in a few minutes, Doc. Just stick around. Now, Mr. Martinson, you were telling me how you came to this house two weeks ago tonight to see your sister and found that she was gone. Uh, yes. Yes, my brother-in-law, Philip, told me that she'd gone on a vacation. I, I thought it strange at the time that she should have gone away without saying goodbye to me, as we were always very close. But days passed and... And I didn't hear from her. Tell me, was it like your sister to go away and not write? No, no, it wasn't. And, and that's what worried me so. These past two weeks, Philip kept putting me off when I inquired about Vivian's whereabouts. Well, tonight I... Tonight I, I couldn't stand it any longer. And I came to this house to have it out with him. What did your brother-in-law say when he saw you? Well, he was quite agitated at my unexpected arrival. When I couldn't get any satisfaction out of him regarding Vivian, I, I threatened to go to the police. Then he broke down and confessed that he murdered Vivian. When did he murder her? He told me that he'd done it two weeks ago tonight. Why, that was the very night I'd come here to see Vivian, and he told me that she'd left for a vacation. Hmm, I see. Go on. Well, naturally, when he told me he'd murdered her, I, I was aghast. He led me to the woods and, and showed me the grave. We returned to the house, and before I knew what had happened, Philip had taken poison. Then I called the police. Well, it seems like a plain case of murder and suicide. Outside of a few questions at the inquest, I don't think we'll trouble you anymore, Mr. Oh, Martinson. that's quite all right, Inspector. I shall be at your service any time. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Martinson. Uh, yes? I was very much interested in hearing what you had to say to the Inspector regarding the murder of your sister. You say that your brother-in-law confessed to murdering her two weeks ago tonight? Uh, that's right. That would be uh, April 2nd, wouldn't it? Um, yes, that's correct. Then you never saw her alive after the night of April 2nd? Why, oh, I know. Of course not. What are you getting at, Doc? Please, Inspector. Mr. Martinson, would you mind telling me where you live? I... At uh, 425 West 107th Street. Tell me, were some clothes delivered to that address in your care a week ago today, April 9th? Uh, clothes? Yes. To be exact, a woman's sports suit, which cost $64 and arrived COD. Why, 
I know. You're lying, Mr. Martinson. I have in my hand a slip of paper that not only proves that you're lying, but that will send you to the electric chair. Doc, what do you say? Yes, Inspector. Mr. Martinson's plan was perfect, but he... he slipped up badly. He forgot to search Vivian Drake's clothing before he buried her. When I examined her body just now, I found in one of her pockets this receipted bill bearing the date April 9th. That proves beyond a doubt that she wasn't murdered by her husband on April 2nd, as Mr. Martinson here no. claimed. No, no. Yes, Mr. Martinson, the corpse has accused you from the grave of murder and has given us proof of your guilt. No, no, it can't be. I had everything planned perfectly, perfectly, do you hear? Down to the last detail. I couldn't have failed. I couldn't have failed. This is the mysterious traveler again. Have you enjoyed our little trip to the grave? Poor Roger. What a pity. After all that planning and hard work, to be tripped up by a sail slip found on a corpse just goes to prove that you have to be more careful when you're burying people you've murdered. Now, I recall another case where a woman drugged her husband and... Oh, you're getting off at the next stop. I'm sorry. I hope you'll join me again soon. But if you do, please remember this. Next Sunday, I shall take a train that leaves at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. Don't forget, Sunday afternoon at half past three... You've just heard Chapter 20 of The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and unusual brought to you each week by Station WOR. In tonight's program, The Accusing Corpse, Don Randolph played Roger. Also featured were Maurice Tarplin and Philip Clark. The Mysterious Traveler, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is directed by Jock McGregor. Original music was played by Doc Whipple. Listen next week to a tale titled Escape by Death. Another tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler is presented by WOR Mutual every Sunday over most of these stations. But beginning next week, the mysterious traveler will be presented at a new time, Sunday afternoons at 3.30. Please note the change in time. 3.30 3.30 every Sunday afternoon, beginning next Sunday. This is Mutual. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Night Beat. Hi, this is Randy Stone. 
I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. You know, stories start out in many different ways. Tonight's story started when I walked into a nice little guy's private world and it blew up right in my face. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. When the streetcars and the subways spill out their thousands of tired ones who scurry off into a million directions to find home, that's when my job begins. I start walking, looking for my story so that you can read about it in your morning newspaper and feel good because it didn't happen to you. Tonight I got my story fast. Just walking down Madison Street, west, away from the center of things. I kept walking past the shooting gallery... The nickel arcade with the peep shows and the fortune-telling machines. The jukebox taverns. <laughs> Madison Street, the quick route to happiness with the world's worst hangover. And then straight ahead of me was Pop Gordon's training gym. That's where the public pays 30 cents to watch fellas training to beat each other's brains out. You know, when I got inside, it looked like just one of those fights. And then I heard one voice over the other. It was a voice I knew. Somebody call the cops and get that punchy loon out of here. You yellow stupid bum, Sully, you laughed at me. What's the matter, Pop? At me, you Yeah. This crazy owl's gone clear off his rocker. Well, that's Billy. Yeah. Somebody call the cops. Wait a second, Pop. He's all right. Sure, sure. Listen to him. I'll kill you. Anybody lays a glove on me gets killed. You'll Only one place for a loon like that in a bug more. house. I'm going to get the cops and have this owl tied up. Oh, now, wait a minute, Pop. Let me uh, talk to him. Randy, stay away from that lot. Five of us couldn't hold him. He knows me. Randy, the guy's gone nuts. I... Yeah. Yeah, like I said, everybody's scared of getting the same... Hey, Billy! Billy, Billy! What? Hi, Billy. How's it going? Uh, you coming in with me? No, sure, sure. Make me a big man getting into the same ring with a champ. Well, that's me, champ. And you're a two-bit bum. Well, that's a thumbnail description if I ever heard one. Admit it. The truth. A two-bit bum. Admit it. I admit it. I admit it, Billy. Yeah, but you don't mean it. You're laughing at me like the rest of me. You're laughing at me. Billy, I never laughed at you in my life. You're laughing? Well, I'll show you what happens to anybody who laughs at Billy the Kid. <laughs> As the world flew away in all directions, I dimly remembered how the sports writers used to speak so respectfully of Billy's fast left hand. But brother, if they knew what I just found out about his right. When the fog finally cleared, Pop Gordon was bending over me, and there were a lot of other faces, too. But I didn't see Billy when I stood up. You okay, Randy? Oh, this is being okay. I don't want any part of it. He slugged you, but good. Where is he? Well, he took off before the cops come. Took off before anybody could grab him. I don't blame him. Yeah. I let that bum come in the gym and sit around. Everybody else pays 30 cents but him. I let him free. What's he do, huh? What's he do? He busts loose. He blows his top. But why? What happened to Billy? Oh, I don't know. Tonight, I catch him putting a bite on my customers. Two bits here, a dime there. Billy was panhandling? Sure. Like I said, I didn't like it, so I tell him. And then what? I don't know. I'm over at the other side of the gym. I hear somebody laugh, and the next thing I know, the owl's swinging like a windmill. He's going to kill everybody just for being around. He ought to be tied up. Uh Uh-huh, just like that, huh? Yeah, he ain't safe. What do you want, the black Mariah to come around, cart him away like a load of rubbish? Yeah, but for his own good. Oh, Pop. Yeah. Remember when he was champ? He packed him in every club where he fought. He had a dollar or five dollars for anybody who held out a hand. So? What are you getting at? Well, now he's got no one, Pop, and now he's out in the cold. Aye. Yeah. Oh, I'll forget the cops. But we still got to put them away. Well, all right, sure. But let's do it as painless as possible. I'll, uh... I'll keep him with me tonight, and then tomorrow... We'll... You going after him? Yeah, which way'd he go? Uh, straight up the streets, but watch out, Randy. He blows his lid. Yeah, I know. Don't worry. I don't want any rematch. I'd like to know why he blew his lid in the first place, and my jaw in the second place. <laughs> I'd known Billy a long time. A sweet, gentle guy who always seemed to be living in a world all of his own. A world that nobody else knew about and cared less. 
And now he was in trouble. In his mood, he might hurt someone, or worse, he might get himself hurt. I must have walked for half an hour before I finally spotted him. He was standing on a corner. I stopped and watched him for a couple of minutes. I watched his hesitant and embarrassed panhandling. Then I walked over to him, slowly. Hello, Billy. What? Oh, hiya, hiya, Randy, old pal, old pal, hiya. You want some company? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> go, go. <laughs> Randy, wh- where you been keeping yourself? I-, I ain't seen you for a couple of weeks. You haven't seen me for a couple of weeks? Well, I, I thought maybe you'd forget an old pal, huh? No, you're <laughs> not the kind of a fellow one forgets, champ. Mm-mm. Now, what was the uh, trouble back at the gym? Gym? What gym? Pop Gordon's. Pop's place? Yeah. Well, well let's go. I, I gotta help Pop. He- he's a good joy, you know. He never charges me nothing. Wait a minute, hold on a second, Billy. Hold but, on. Yeah? Weren't you at the gym tonight? Oh, no, not tonight. I, I've been here. And you didn't, uh, massage my chin? You, you're giving me a rib. Well, what you looking at me for like that, Randy? Forget it, Billy. You, you was just ribbing, huh? Oh, sure, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I like ribs. I'm not giving the hot foot nothing like that, but funny ribs that, that don't hurt nobody. No, sure. <laughs> Can I ask you a $64 question? Well, sure not. You, you can ask me anything, Randy, anything. I saw you a minute ago, Billy. What? I never seen you ask for a touch before. Uh, I, I, I ain't never gonna do it no more, but... But, Randy, I, I got it tonight. I, I gotta get a few bucks. Maybe 15 I already got $2. Maybe... Why 15. do you need $15? What? I, I, I gotta get a new suit. A new suit? What's so special about tonight, Billy? Well, that, that, there's something I, I gotta do. It, I just gotta do it, Randy. I gotta have 15, but... Hey, them scars. Hey! Is that you, Randy? Yeah. Oh, Sullivan! Yeah. Randy, don't let him pick me up for panhandling, please. No, I won't, please Billy. Don't. Now, you wait here. Wait here. I'll be right back. Yeah. yeah. That's Billy back there, isn't it? Yeah, that's right, Sullivan. Why? Heard you had a little trouble with him back at the gym. Maybe we ought to put him in the tank for the night, keep him out of trouble, huh? Look, uh, look, Sullivan. Uh, he's going away tomorrow for a long time. Oh, like that, huh? Yeah, that, that's it. This is his last night out. Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, good. That's the way I do it myself. I'll see you around, Randy, but keep an eye on him. Yeah, I'll watch him like a hawk. Thanks, Sullivan. So long. Uh, well, what they say, Randy, they... They ain't gonna pick me up for mooching on it. They ain't going. No, no, no. Of course not. Uh, look, uh, Billy, how'd you like to come to my apartment for a while? Oh, I can't. I told you, I gotta get fifteen bucks. Well, we'll talk about it. Well, I gotta get it tonight. Now, I gotta get a new suit because, because. Yeah, go, go on. Why? I I can't be wearing this crummy rag when when I see her. Not when when I see her. <laughs> I didn't know what he meant, but whatever had made him go crazy at the gym, whatever had made him hit me was tied in with her. Who she was, I didn't know, and I wasn't sure that he knew. I finally talked him into going to my place, and when we went in, I watched that slow, gentle smile come over his face. Hey, this place is a number one. Yeah. Sit down, Billy. I ain't got much time. Just a couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh... Uh, I, I'm awful tired, Randy. <laughs> Seems like a lot of things has happened tonight, you know. I, I, I'm kind of tired, sir. Want a drink, Billy? Oh, no. I, I, I never touch it, you know that. Yeah. And you never panhandled before. Well, I, I ain't gonna do that no more just tonight. I, I never bummed off of nobody. I paid my own way. Come anything, I, I paid my own way. Yeah, that's why I want to know why you're putting the bite on people tonight. I ain't gonna tell you. You, you. you laugh. I won't laugh. You will. So somebody else laughed when I told you. Some, somebody laughed. and well, when, when somebody laughs at me, I, I don't like it. All I right, tell easy, you, easy, I, buddy. I, easy, easy. I, Come on now. Uh, That's better. I, I tell you, I, I, I gotta get 15 bucks. Hey, hey, look. L- look at this. What's that, Billy? I, I cut it out of the paper today. I, I seen it. Hey, you, you take a look at it, huh? You, you read what it All says. Right. Mrs. Walter Compton and her husband... Yeah? Yeah, go on, that's more. 
prominent society leaders of New York will be in town tonight. They're staying at the Lake Shore, and... I can't go there in this crummy rag. Well, why do you have to see her? What? Well, I, I gotta tell her something. Hey, hey, this is getting late, Randy. I, I gotta get... I'll lend you the $15, Billy. You? Oh, no. No, I pay my own way. Well, pay it back whenever you get a job. No, I don't want any handouts. It's just a loan, Billy. It's a loan. What? Ah, <laughs> uh, thanks, Randy. You, you're a champ. Now, now tell me why you got to see her. You, you ain't gonna laugh. I, I can take anything but that. Anything. I won't laugh, Billy. No, I, I, I guess you wouldn't. Okay. You, you remember once I was champ? Oh, right? everybody knows you were champ. Now, what about her, Mrs. Compton? Yeah. Well, it's one night after a fight, see? I ain't champ yet, but I'm punching right up to the top, see? Okay, but this one fight, she ain't there. So I go to see her at her place. She's there. She's there. And so when I... Who's that? It's me, Billy. Where are you? Yeah, out in a minute. Sure. Hey, I win tonight. I said I win tonight, didn't I? Yeah, I heard on the radio. Well... Well, what? It don't mean a thing? Sure. Means a lot, I guess. You guess? <laughs> a kid for a dollar who's gonna marry the next middleweight champ, you sure take things like a lump of ice. Yeah. Edna. Anything wrong? No. Nope. Oh, there is. Okay, something's wrong. Have it your way. <laughs> you, you, you wasn't at the fight tonight, baby. I, I looked for you. It took me three, four rounds to get going because I didn't see you. You won. Oh. Kid, look at me. Sure. The eye got torn open again, huh? Oh, oh that's nothing. Collodion fixed it. Collodion up. fixes everything, huh? Get cut up, use collodion. That's nice. That puts you all together again. How long do you think you'll stay together? What, what's eating on you, honey? The last two, three weeks. The last been... two, three weeks. The last two, three years. Yeah, that's right. I hate it. You hate what? Oh, shut up. Oh, kid, kid, what's wrong? You and me. Oh, I don't get it. The only thing you do get is a measly few bucks for getting your head knocked off. Oh, I'm a fighter, So you're honey. a fighter. All right, fight. But count me out. Oh, now, wait a I've minute. I've been waiting. I've been waiting for him to carry you home. Me? <laughs> me? It can't happen, huh? Well, all of a sudden, you start blowing your top. It's not all of a sudden. You said it. You said there was something wrong for the last two, three years. Okay. Okay, spill it. I'm through, Billy. Washed up. Finished. What? You and me. Done. Since when? Since right now. <laughs> oh, baby, it's just the eye. You see me this way and you... <laughs> the eye. <laughs> Don't laugh at me, Edna. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. I take anything but being laughed at. It is a laugh. Oh, now listen, you listen, honey. I don't care if you get punched all over the state. I don't care if you get your brains rattled so hard. It's Edna. me I care about from now on. Okay. So I'll be champ. So, so you'll get your fur coat. Not from you... you. Not from a guy who's beginning to look like a punching bag instead of a man. Look at me. Take a good look. I am. Yeah, I am. I got looks. I got class. I can do all right. I still don't get it. All right, I'll lay it on the line for you. Want me to? Go ahead. I'm not going to tie myself to a punchy character. I'm not going to have to walk in nice places with a guy whose face is... It... Well, look at her. Go on, take a look in the mirror. You see what I mean? You want me to quit? I don't care if you do or not, because it's too late, Billy. It's too late. Oh, Edna, you... you shouldn't say this. <laughs> Please, Ed. Uh, that, that's the way it was, Randy. That, that's the way it was. Yeah, I see. Look, Billy, you don't want to go and see her after that. Oh, I, I tell you, Randy, I, I got to see her. There's something I got to tell her. and It's got to be tonight because... Tomorrow she'll, she'll be gone. Billy, how do you know that she'll... Well, that she'll see you. Oh, I know, I know, because there's something I, I ain't told you. There's something... Something I ain't never gonna tell nobody. And, uh, 
Rand, Randy, please, please, don't, don't try to stop me. Please don't let nobody try to stop me because, because if, if they do, I'll, I'll kill them. You are listening to Nightbeat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Billy said he'd kill anybody who tried to stop him from seeing Mrs. Walter Compton. I looked at his scarred face and into his eyes. A wild fever you see in the eyes of a dog everyone says is mad, but only wants a drink of water. And then... Uh. I guess I, I shouldn't have said that, Randy. Well, let's forget it for a minute, Billy. Now, tell me, why do you want to see her? <laughs> you don't understand dames, huh? <laughs> no, my mother never told me. Well, well, she gives me the brush, see, like I tell you. She, she gives me the brush, but but she does it for me, see? She, she don't want me to get my brains knocked out, see? Yeah, I'm I'm beginning to see, Billy. Sure. But me, I got no sense, so so I don't see it her way. So I, I, I let her walk out, and I don't see her no more. Not until I get hold of that paper today. And tonight you want to see her? To say what, Billy? Well, but don't you see? She loves me. All these years, she, she never lets up. And I, 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 I want to tell her it's okay that maybe her and me, we can start all over like, see? Uh, what's the matter, Randy? Nothing. Nothing, Billy. Look, don't let anybody kid you, pal. You're still champion. Oh, I ain't nothing. But, uh... Oh, I, I gotta go now. I, I gotta get 15 bucks for a Now, second. look, look, you're tired. You need a shave. Maybe take a shower. You thought of that? No. All right, now you wait here and take a shower and a shave, and I'll bring a suit back for you. Is that a deal? Oh, gee, you, you, you're a champ, Randy, a real champ. I might be gone for a little while, Billy, but when I come back, everything will be okay. Sure. Okay. <laughs> There was only one thing for me to do, go and see Mrs. Walter Compton. I made sure that Billy couldn't leave my apartment. I locked the door from the outside. I didn't want him picked up before he had the chance to see her. To see the woman around whom he'd built a whole world of fantasy in which he'd lived for so many years. I didn't want that world to come down around his ears. My newspaper pass got me in to see Mrs. Walter Compton in her suite at the lakeshore. You're Mr. Stone? Yes, I am, Mrs. Compton. You're from the newspaper. Well, I'm not on newspaper business, uh, Mrs. Compton. Not tonight. This is more personal. Really? Well, what can I, um... Uh, do for me? Uh, nothing. Then please get to the point, Mr. Stone. My husband will be here shortly with guests. How soon? An hour. Why? Well, uh, because it concerns someone you used to know. Really? Who? Billy Candell. Billy Candell. Yes, he was better known as Billy the Kid, once middleweight champion of the world. Oh, I'd forgotten. <laughs> and I was glad to. Uh, Mrs. Compton, he's coming here tonight to see you. What? He's coming? <laughs> How stupid can you get? Well, for a lot of people, it's not hard to be stupid <laughs> or uh, heartless. Yours must be a rather sentimental column, Mr. Stone. Uh, yes, it's about people. You'd better go. Look, uh, Please see, Billy, what can you lose? It's out of the question. Listen, all he wants is to tell you something. He wants to tell you that... that he knows that you still love him. What? Oh, oh no. Oh, now listen to me, please. <laughs> now, tomorrow he's going to... Well, he's going where he can rest. He's sick, Mrs. Compton. He's desperately sick. Let's not be so polite. The word is punch drunk, I believe. You want me to see a lunatic? No, he's not. And I'll be here when he comes. We'll keep it between us three. Do you know what you're asking? Yes, I'm asking you to give a guy a few minutes of his world. Make it real for him. Tell him anything. Tell him you still love him. Then he'll go away. After tomorrow, you'll never see him or hear from him again. You're asking me to receive that... that thing and to bring him into this hotel where everyone can see him? Do you know what that means? Well, to him, yes. I'm talking about myself. Myself, Mr. Stone. Yes, I'd like to get off that subject for a it's moment. It's the only subject that matters. If you don't see him, he'll crack up all the way. That happened long ago. Good evening, Mr. Stone. Three minutes of your time. I said no. Did you hear, Mr. Stone? I said no. Okay, lady, I'm going. Uh, thank you for everything that's been lovely. You needn't be sarcastic, Mr. Stone. Oh, needn't I be? Look, Queenie, I got a little spot announcement for you. 
Billy owes you a vote of thanks. You'll never know it, but she gave him the biggest break of his life when you walked out on him years ago. Oh, really? Yes, positively. Tonight you're giving him even a bigger break. Tell me about it, Mr. Stone. Yes, I'll tell you. <laughs> the only thing that poor guy's got left is his memory of a girl named Edna. Any resemblance between that memory and you was strictly coincidental. Goodbye. <laughs> I was glad to get out into the fresh air. All the way back to my apartment, I kept thinking of what I'd tell Billy. How I'd tell him. Then as I walked across the lobby toward the elevator... Mr. Stone, Mr. Stone! Uh, oh, what is it, Charlie? Hey, here's a message for you. Okay. Yes, you are, Mr. Stone. Thank you. How long ago he leave this? Oh, what, just a few minutes after you left. <laughs> did you know you'd left him locked in? He called down. He asked me to open the yeah, door. Yeah, did right? he say where he was uh, going? No, 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 just that he couldn't wait for you any longer. Oh, that is on the note. How'd he look? How'd he look? Well, I mean, anything unusual about him? No, I... He had on one of your suits, I remember now, that, that pinstripe one. He must have stolen. No, right he didn't your... steal anything. Now, listen to me. Uh, I'm going to the Lakeshore Hotel. If he comes back here, get in touch with me there. Mrs. Compton's suite. Mrs. Compton's suite, yes. Oh, and listen, I think you'd better call the police. But as for Kalski, remember that Kalski? Kalski. Tell him to meet me at the Lakeshore Hotel and quick. <laughs> I took a cab and I took the shortest way to the lakeshore. I watched the pavements looking for Billy, but I didn't see him. He had some money on him and he must have taken a cab himself. And then I was back at the lakeshore talking with the clerk at the desk there. Yes, sir, there was a, a man here of that description. He asked that a call be put through to Mrs. Compton's suite. And was it? Well, sir, he, he was a rather... Well, yes, he... yes, I, I know, I know. So he didn't get through. Oh, I called Mrs. Compton's suite myself and told her... That is, I described the man. I... Yes, go ahead. What'd she say? That on no account was I to put him through or send him upstairs. Oh, well. Okay, that's something. What'd he do then? He left immediately. Which way? Oh, I'm afraid I didn't notice, sir. I was registering some new guests and I paid no attention. Okay, to him. thank you very much. I had to find Billy before... Well, before what? What would he do? Where would he go? I asked myself those questions as I walked slowly along, watching for him... Hoping to see that pathetic figure in my pinstripe suit. Hoping I'd get to him before someone else stopped him. I was afraid of what might happen or could happen. And then I saw him, just past the Lakeshore Hotel, shambling slowly along, his shoulders hunched against the wind that cut in off the lake. I ran and caught up with him. Billy! Billy! What? Oh, hi, Randy. Hi. What, what you doing over here? Oh, I just, uh, looking around. Why'd you leave my apartment? What? Oh, well, well, you was gone so long and I had to get going, see? Oh, sure. Come on, let's walk. Yeah. Hey, I, I borrowed one of your suits. It, uh, it's a, a real champ suit, all right. You, you mind, huh? You no, mind? no, Billy, none at all. Did you see her? Oh, oh, sure. What, you did? Uh, yeah, I, I see her. Billy, they wouldn't let you go up, remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, but, but, uh... I, I went up the back. The back, Billy. Now look at me. Are you sure? Oh, sure. And 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 she still loves me, Randy. I, I said everything was okay. She's crazy about me like like she always. Was. What did she tell you? Well, well, she she didn't want to talk to me. You know how she is. But then I told her I love her and and she loves me. Yeah. And, Billy. And, Billy. I, I'm tired, Randy. Lots of things happened tonight. Lots of things. Yeah, I know. What do you say we go someplace for coffee? Yeah, yeah, I'd like that. I'm awful tired. And, and when I get real rested good, I'll go back to see her. Her and me, we'll start over again. Hey, hey, this is where she lives, you know? Yeah. Look, I, I gotta see her once more, Randy. Maybe she'll talk to me this time. Huh? Not tonight anymore, Billy. Uh, but I, I want her to talk to me. Well, I don't... She will. Yeah, she will. She loves me. Billy, now listen to me. You let me go up there first. I'll talk to her and fix everything, okay? Well, tell her not to act like a kid. Tell her to talk to me. Yes, sure, sure. I'll tell her, but you must... Put... Hey, Stone? Yes, Kolsky? You put in a call for us? Oh, yes, I did. It's okay now. I found him. What you call the cops for, Randy? Oh, Kolsky's not a cop. He's a pal of yours. Huh? He thinks you're the greatest fighter that ever lived. He always wanted to talk to you about your big fight. Oh, sure, sure. But but we're busy now. I, I'll talk to you about it later, Kolsky. I gotta see somebody. Billy, I promised you I'd see her, remember? You, you're gonna tell her I'll be waiting? Sure, sure. Now, you just stay with Kolsky here. Tell him uh, about the night you won the belt. Anything the matter, Stone? No, no, no. Just keep him here. I'll answer questions later. 
Now, Billy. Yeah? Promise me you'll stay right here. You, you won't stay long, huh? J- just tell her she loves me and, and, and I want her to talk to me. Sure, I will. Okay, now you wait here. I didn't think it would do any good to see her again, but I wanted to give Billy a good memory to take along. I saw her all right, but she didn't talk to me either. I went back downstairs and out to the street. I hadn't been gone more than five minutes, but they were the longest five minutes of my life. Brother, I was beat. Hey, hey, Rhonda, you see her, huh? You see her? Yeah, I saw her, Billy. What did she say? Huh? You tell me what she said. Huh? Well, I told her. Hey, Stone, how long does this go on? This is a prowl car, not a bus. Yeah, we're coming along with you. Yeah, what's the idea? Get in the back, Billy. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kind of tired. I, I'd kind of like to ride to your place, Randy. Sure. Take us to the precinct, Kulski. Listen, Randy. Did you see his girl? Yes, I saw her, but she didn't talk to me either. I guess she laughed once too often. She's dead. Huh? All right, now just take it easy, Kulski. The poor guy doesn't even know that he killed her. <laughs> are going out all over the city, even those neon signs on Madison Street. I've got to write my piece and put it in the slot, but what can I say? The story of a one-sided love? Well, if that's what love does to you, I'll stick to Pinochle. It's a funny thing about love, isn't it? Let someone get up and talk about hate, and he's hailed as a new leader. Let him speak of love, and he's ridiculed, he's spat upon, and... Even nailed to a cross. Love is the greatest thing, the oldest yet the latest thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Copy, boy. Night Beat, a new dramatic series, stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Tonight's story was written by Russell Hughes. Night Beat is edited by Larry Marcus and directed by Warren Lewis. Music by Frank Worth. The part of the prize fighter was played by Bill Conrad. Others in tonight's cast were Lorene Tuttle, Bill Lally, Larry Dobkin, and Leo Cleary. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Rock Bottom, released by Warner Brothers. Listen next week at this same time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. The stories that come out of the shadows to find their way into Night Beat. There's another great action-packed program you'll enjoy listening to on NBC every Sunday. It's Christopher London with Glenn Ford in the title role. Christopher London was created especially for radio by the world's most widely read mystery writer, Earl Stanley Gardner. You'll truly enjoy this fast-moving mystery adventure series when you tune to NBC next Sunday on most of these same NBC stations. Stay tuned for Brian Donlevy and Dangerous Assignment on NBC. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. You can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression 
addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio